In this compilation video, I invite you to revisit some of the cases of alien abductions and UFOs featured on my channel in 2023. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. In the summer of 1977, the prolific UFO investigator and author Andrew Collins encountered a case of alien abduction that he would ultimately exalt as the most important British case ever. Concerning an ordinary young family of five, the events allegedly took place some three years prior, on Sunday the 27th of October 1974. The happenings were so traumatic, involving the late-night kidnapping of three young children, as well as non-consensual medical examinations by alien beings and three hours of missing time, that the parents were too scared to speak out about what they had experienced. This fear is said to have worsened with time, with the family being subsequently harassed by police stalked by shadowy men in black figures, and exposed to a whole host of terrifying otherworldly activity in their home. Ultimately, they could cope no longer, and reached out to a local UFO group in response to an article published in a local newspaper. Desperate, so they said, to come forward and get what had happened to them off their chests. Through his investigation, Collins was able to share their story with the world, recording details, drawings, and even disturbing transcripts from hypnotic regression sessions undergone by the family's father. The family, so Collins concluded, were thoroughly genuine, proving not merely that UFO and alien abduction phenomena is real, but that it can happen to any one of us at any time. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. It was almost 10 o'clock at night, and the Avis family were on their way home after visiting Mother Elaine's parents. Described as a very normal, simple, and warm East London family, they lived in a semi-detached house in Averley, Essex. A mere 15 miles from the bustling city of London, the area was sporadically rural, and remains suitably so today. As such, on their drive home from nearby Harold Hill, they passed through patches of open countryside. Their route was usual, south from Hornchurch and along Hackton Lane, a journey of about nine miles which ought to have taken them twenty minutes. For indeed, Father John intended to watch a play on the television that night. Setting off at ten to ten provided him with ample time to get home in time. And yet, unlike so many other occasions, the journey back to Averley would not go as planned that night. Listening to the car radio, parents in the front, two of the children, Karen and Stuart, asleep in the back, and eldest boy Kevin awake and looking out of the window, the family are said to have noticed something strange in the sky above the houses which lined the road. It was a pale blue, iridescent light, shaped like an oval around 500 yards away. Described by the family as being akin to a bright star, it appeared to be following them, travelling in the same direction as the car, but stopping and starting as it moved. At first, the family assumed they were looking at a helicopter. And yet, the longer it seemed to follow them, being obscured momentarily as they drove through a small area of woodland, it was clear that they were witnessing something unusual. Eerily, there was no other traffic on the road, and so driving through open, dark countryside, the only light that the family could see was this peculiar object. When the road turned sharply to the left, becoming Park Farm Road, the light turned also, changing its course so it seemed, so as to continue following the car. After about half a mile, it appeared to adjust itself once again, putting it on a direct collision course with the road and the Avis family. As they approached a block of four terraced houses, the light disappeared from view behind thick bushes. Now on Averley Road, it was at this moment that John and Elaine were consumed by the feeling that something was terribly wrong. 
entering a bend at 30 miles per hour, the air around them is said to have changed. Sound faltered, with neither the engine nor the tires of the car being audible. The only sound was that of the radio. That too, however, ultimately disappeared, as ahead of them on the road, just as they came through the bend, they were confronted by a wall of green mist. Dense, some eight to nine feet high, it covered the road in front of them. The radio cut out, crackling and smoking, causing John to let go of the steering wheel and pull out the wires. With that, the lights in the car died also, and the engine faltered. Still traveling at 30 miles per hour, the Avis family was subsequently engulfed by the green fog. And it was not like any other fog that they had ever experienced. Curling around the exterior of the car, the green atmosphere was chillingly cold. Karen and Stuart still asleep in the back, the three other occupants struggled to maintain consciousness. Everything was hazy and silent, and there was a tingling sensation that made it difficult to determine anything, even whether or not the car was still moving. Even so, the experience seemed to last no more than a mere second or two. Then there was a jolt, like a car going over a humpback bridge, and the green fog was gone. The car lights returned, as did engine functionality, meaning that John was able to continue driving his family home. Elaine did, however, for reasons she at the time did not understand, ask, is everybody here? She and John were both very nervous and frightened, but everyone was indeed there. Kevin awake and looking out of the window, and Karen and Stuart in undisturbed slumber. When they arrived home, the sleeping children were carried to bed, and John, exhausted, sat down to watch his television program. It was then that he and his wife realised the incredible. It was 1 a.m. Their 20-minute journey had taken three hours. In the months that followed, the Avis family experienced incredible changes. Their personal relationship with food and drink altered, with all members of the family, bar the youngest, Stuart, switching to a vegetarian diet. Meat, once eaten in abundance, now provoked not merely nausea, but physical illness in the Avises, with the parents especially also acquiring, suddenly and previously out of character, strong views regarding humanity's destruction of the planet and plentiful slaughter of animals. Alcohol was likewise askewed. In addition, John, previously a heavy smoker, happily smoking some 60 to 70 cigarettes a day, completely and suddenly abandoned the habit after the experience. By Christmas, he suffered a nervous breakdown, with him being forced to quit his job and remain out of the workforce until the following September. And so, whatever had happened that night in October, specifically during those missing three hours, affected the Avis family at a fundamental level. Their world was turned upside down. Not merely that, external forces seemed to be having an impact. The family claimed that they were regularly followed by cars with tinted windows. In particular, they noted that the same three cars followed them well into the summer of next year. They were also, so they later claimed, stalked by men in black type figures, even describing how, on one occasion, two sat in a parked car opposite their house from 9pm until 1am. Ultimately, John was forced to phone the police to get rid of them, with the officer who arrived also acting suspiciously, turning up on their doorstep, so the family claimed, too quickly and without proper ID. This person supposedly drove away with the other two oddly behaving men. Such stalking is said to have continued, with the family's telephone ringing on multiple occasions without there being anyone on the other end, or, in the worst case, only the sinister sound of heavy breathing. This seeming campaign of harassment culminated in John when out and about in his car, being persistently stopped by men claiming to be police officers. At its peak, this was said to have happened at least five times a week, with John, in order to comply with the law, being forced to attend his nearest police station so as to produce all relevant documents each and every time. This lasted for around a month. And as unsettling as these happenings were for the family, they were arguably minuscule compared to some of the other events reported by John and Elaine. 
At home, doors closed to the outside world. They were disturbed by bizarre noises and what can only be described as eerie poltergeist-like activity. Objects moved around the house, even when the children were not at home. Droning noises were heard, mostly after midnight, as though something was approaching and then hovering over the house. The sound would get louder, horrifyingly so, before cutting out to absolute silence. In time, this became such a regular occurrence that others, including Elaine's sister Anne, would hear it too when they would visit the house so as to babysit. Other auditory anomalies included mysterious clicking noises, and even something that, so the family claimed, sounded like Morse code. Such was heard once again late at night in John and Elaine's bedroom. The meaning of the sounds was not, despite attempts, able to be discerned. Perhaps most chilling of all, however, was the claim made by their young son, Kevin. Sometime during 1975 or 1976, he woke in the middle of the night to see a strange man standing by the side of his bed. The figure, so the boy claimed, resembled a clown. Dressed in white, there was little John and Elaine's son could remember other than the figure's appearance, and how terrified it made him feel. His parents likewise alleged horrific nighttime experiences, including fragmented flashes of dreams in which they were being medically examined by gnomes or similarly small, ugly-looking things. And so, by the time researcher and author Andrew Collins became involved in the case in 1977, the Avis family were exhausted by their experience and its aftermath. Encouraged to reach out after reading an article on UFOs in their local newspaper, they also wanted to get what had happened to them off their chests and, if at all possible, understand it better. Collins and fellow UFO researcher Barry King arranged to meet with John and Elaine on the 15th of August 1977. The first step, so Collins explained in the article he published the following year, was to establish the facts of the case via interviews. This achieved, he also set about proving some of the details of John and Elaine's story, such as the length of time that their October night journey ought to have taken as well as the time that the television program they returned home, expecting to watch, was broadcast. He also tested their pre-existing knowledge of UFOs and famous abduction cases, including the arguably similar 1961 Betty and Barney Hill incident. Aside from basic, general knowledge of extraterrestrial phenomena, gathered through one or two television programs that they had seen, the couple knew little. In Colin's words, it seemed that their knowledge of the subject was very limited. And so, suitably impressed as to the genuineness of their claims, the researcher then suggested that the couple undergo hypnotic regression. This, after all, may be the way to unlock the secrets as to their missing three hours. And yet, the Avises, Elaine especially, were reluctant. As terrible as their experiences, both original and ongoing, had been, they were fearful as to where hypnotic regression could lead. Even so, John ultimately agreed. After all, the trauma of that night was still haunting him and his family. The nightmares, for example, of gnomish creatures and medical experimentations were not going away. The Avises had to find out what had happened to them during those lost three hours. And so it was on the 25th of September 1977 that John, along with Andrew Collins, Barry King, and a couple of other researchers met with Dr. Leonard Wilder, a dental surgeon who had, for the past 20 years, used hypnotism to conduct research into reincarnation. The first session did not result in regression. John was said to have been very worried, almost cancelling the appointment at the last minute, and so the doctor instead focused on putting his mind at ease and performing what are described by Collins as basic arm levitation exercises in order to assess his suitability and sensitivity towards hypnotism. It was concluded that John was indeed a very good subject, meaning that a second session was arranged for the following Sunday. It was on this day that some of the most shocking and sensational details about the Avis family's experiences were revealed. 
Again joined by Andrew Collins and other researchers, John was put into a state of hypnosis by Dr. Wilder. Regressed back through his childhood, stopping at the ages of 13, 11, 5 and then 3, John's voice is said to have changed each time, sounding more and more childlike. Happy with this response, Dr. Wilder then asked to hypnotise John to recall the night that he and his family drove home to Averley. He first asked him to talk about the light that had followed their car. It was low, John is recorded as having said, bright and not one colour. He then went on to explain, in fragmented, mesmeric speech, how he and his family had driven into a very, very thick and green mist, with no lights and no noise all around. Prompted by the doctor to describe what happened next, a hypnotised John is claimed to have said, into a big room. There, he explained, he was separated from his children. Not to worry, John mumbled, hypnotised. That is what the beings had told him and Elaine. What followed next, revealed through this second hypnotic regression session, is nothing short of terrifying. After driving into the green mist, John and his family are said to have been taken on board an alien craft. Specifically, a big room, where he, separated from his wife and children, interacted with two species of alien. The first were described as tall and arguably eerie given the sinister nature of the situation, peaceful. They wore some manner of one-piece suit, which covered nearly all of them, aside from a small portion of their face. The colour of their skin was translucent or hollow-looking, and their eyes were said to have been very pink. When they communicated with John, they did so, he suggested, telepathically. I thought what they were saying, John explained, hypnotised. These tall entities are said to have watched on, as John was examined by a second species of being. Lying on some manner of peculiar examination table, John is said to have experienced a flat bar pass over the length of his body, seemingly scanning him. This medical machine was operated by a small, servile, fur-covered being. In time, both John and Elaine would produce sketches of the aliens they met on board the craft. Over the course of John's third meeting with Dr. Wilder, a session which a scared Elaine reluctantly attended also, if only to witness and not participate in, John revealed further details about his and his family's abduction experience. This time, being directly interviewed by researcher Andrew Collins, John spoke more about the alien he described as the Examiner. This being's face, so he said, mumbling, hypnotised, was not very nice. It had big eyes and a mouth unlike ours. As the session continued, more questions were put to John. The answers were stranger and more sinister than anything that had come before. Why have they come here? asked Dr. Wilder. To observe and to lead was John's reply. They said they need us as hosts. When asked where the beings had come from, John, still hypnotised, told the doctor that there was no need for them to say, as they had no need to return to where they had come from. They, chillingly, were here to stay, to observe and to lead humankind. No visit, Collins recorded John as having said, no visit, they are here always. John then said that the beings have more than one base on Earth. When asked where, he no longer responded. Silent, still hypnotically regressed, neither Dr. Wilder nor Collins could get John to say any more. Slowly, he was brought back to normal consciousness. Discussing his experience afterwards, he told Collins that he felt as though he had been blocked during the session. He, even hypnotised, had been prevented from saying anything more about the beings who had abducted him. Given the eerie nature of John's hypnotic regression sessions, it is arguably no surprise that Elaine maintained her position of not wanting to undergo the same. Regardless, watching her husband's session, and more generally discussing her experiences with Andrew Collins and other researchers, is said to have triggered remembrance in the young mother's mind. Dreams, which before had been fragmented and ephemeral, became more vivid 
with both Elaine and John, the more that they explored their experiences, able to share additional information with Collins. As Collins wrote in his 1978 article, the hypnosis sessions were valuable in that they began the process of unburdening the witnesses' subconscious memories, allowing for their conscious memory to return to them. Not only that, they, so Collins explained, militate against the idea that the Avis family got their heads together to perpetrate an almighty hoax. After all, John's sessions, carefully transcribed for publication in journals at the time, were overseen by medical professionals, and as such, were widely considered remarkably genuine. With this in mind, the additional details provided by the Avis family can be said to elevate this case once more, truly justifying the opening claim made by Andrew Collins of the Averley abduction representing one of the most important British cases ever. Certainly, both John and Elaine were able to, independently of one another, describe and even draw the beings that had abducted them. Extraordinarily, there can be said to be a high level of similarity between husband and wife. Not only that, their experiences whilst on board the alleged alien craft can be said to be very much the same. Separated from their children, John and Elaine were then separated from each other, each being led away by a tall, suited leader figure through a hole in the wall which was made to appear by the being. Beyond the hole was a room. This space, big, grey and oval, was where, for both John and Elaine, the examination took place. Lying, and in Elaine's case, strapped to an examination table, the small third examiner entity is said to have operated various scanner-like instruments, watched always by the tall beings. John, in one of his many interviews with Andrew Collins, claimed that he felt a warm tingling sensation in the region the scan was immediately covering. There was also a pen-like apparatus, which the examiner used on all parts of the couple's bodies, with Elaine reporting that the being paid particular attention to her left side around the region of her kidney. She did not know why. Regardless, she was very frightened and struggled against her straps. At this point, she told of how one of the tall entities advised her that they couldn't do anything with her while she was like that and then proceeded to place his middle finger on her forehead and his two outer fingers on the outside of her eyes, causing her to black out. Horrifyingly, this was not the only time that the couple reported being made to black out or have their consciousness altered in some way by the tall suited beings. John, for example, upon being brought into the examination room through the magically appearing hole, is said to have blacked out after one of the tall entities touched his left shoulder. Then, later on in the abduction, when Elaine, still distressed at having been forcibly separated from her children, refused to consume food that the entities offered to her, food which she suspected may have been drugged, she was exposed to some manner of mind control. One of the beings, concerned by her distress, offered to play her some music. Bizarrely, the being then used their mind and their hands, twiddling their fingers slowly so as to create a soothing sound, similar to a high-pitched harp. Upon hearing it, Elaine felt herself slowly relax, even as her mind raced for her children. Sensing her continuing concern, the being is reported as having said to her, Your children are safe. You value your children. We do not reproduce. We do not have children. We reproduce through you. You are our children. Undoubtedly, such a statement is terrifying, especially when considered in relation to some of the other details reported by John and Elaine. The fixation on examining their physical bodies, and even the fact that, at some point during the abduction, presumably one of the many times the couple were unconscious, the beings are claimed to have undressed them, changing them into one-piece suits similar to those which the tall beings themselves wore. And, of course, the eerie statement revealed during John's second hypnotic session, they need us as hosts. As the abduction progressed, the initial medical examination over, John and Elaine claimed to have been given a tour of the alien craft, with both of them being instructed to lie down and watch a screen. 
This screen, so they both reported, displayed a series of rapid images, of maps and pictures and diagrams, too rapid for either John or Elaine to properly remember. Each image was, so John explained, accompanied verbally, with a voice inside his mind providing a complete explanation for each. When he expressed to the tall being who was with him that the images were moving too fast for him to remember, he was told, once again, not to worry. It is all being remembered by your mind, the entity is said to have communicated to him. For Elaine, she too struggled to recall any of what she had been shown, telling Andrew Collins that the experience was akin to having the contents of an encyclopedia pumped into one's head all in one go. Something that both John and Elaine did remember, however, was being shown some manner of advanced hologram. It was a planet, specifically, so they alleged to have been told, the planet of the beings in its last years. Ruined by pollution and other natural problems, the beings explained that it had been lost, along with two of their suns and one of their moons, through misuse. In Elaine's testimony, she recalled being told, this is where we come from, and then, this is the seed of life, our past and your future, our whole existence. Oddly, John also reported, something which he was told by the beings, that in addition to how they travel to Earth to use humans as hosts, that they are us. Describing how the beings came to Earth, John explained that they were able to travel very fast, almost instantaneous. This, so he was told, was achieved by using some sort of activator that was able to convert particles and manipulate gravitational forces that thus moved the craft. As for navigating Earth's atmosphere, the ship is said to have utilised something called magnetic drive, once again suggesting particle manipulation. Ultimately, the abduction ended with John and Elaine being returned to their car and their children. While the two youngest, Karen and Stuart, appeared to have remained asleep on the back seat of the vehicle for the entire length of the experience, their eldest son, Kevin, who had been awake at the point of driving into the mysterious green mist, had seemingly been taken elsewhere on the craft to have his own abduction experience. Ten years old at the time, his parents, understandably, did not want him to undergo hypnotic regression, and indeed did not even allow Andrew Collins to talk all that much with him. I have only been allowed to speak to Kevin twice concerning the incident the researcher wrote in his article. It is, however, reported that the boy once turned to his father and, quite out of the blue, said, They gave me a lot of things to do when I grow up, but I've forgotten them all. And certainly, whatever these things to do may have been, the family, as has already been discussed, made many lifestyle changes after their abduction experience from vegetarianism to abandoning alcohol and smoking and synthetic colourings and preservatives in foodstuffs. Not inherently negative choices by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, for all of this, it is difficult to ignore the undeniably sinister nature of what the Avis family experienced that night in 1974. After all, this is by no means the only instance of alien abduction that sees supposed abductees be exposed to what can only be described as environmentalist propaganda. Images of natural destruction, a planet doomed through waste and misuse. And whilst we can all agree that pollution and a lack of care in regards to natural resources are problems we face here on Earth, it is distinctly distasteful to consider how an extraterrestrial species might regard it as their duty to abduct, examine, indoctrinate, and thus forcibly make mankind understand these issues, all because they want to help us, naturally. But perhaps I am getting ahead of myself. For certainly, what the Avises reported is incredible, sensational, shocking, difficult to believe, meaning that there is no way we can be certain as to the truth of their supposed experiences. Indeed, whilst Andrew Collins seems to have been suitably impressed, most especially in regards to John's hypnotic regression sessions, it is not absurd to suggest that prior to their interviews, John and Elaine may have colluded so as to present similar narratives to the researcher. 
ditto their artwork. Whilst we are told that these similarities were produced independently of one another, as a married couple, John and Elaine would have had plenty of opportunities to fabricate a suitably believable, coherent fantasy before meeting with researchers like Collins. And yet, whilst it is appropriate, especially when discussing things such as this, to deploy a healthy dose of scepticism, motive must also be considered. John and Elaine Avis are pseudonyms. It took them three years to come forward to discuss what had happened to them. And in the aftermath, as far as can be discerned, they made no attempt to commercialise their experiences or profit from them in any way. They simply, as they told Collins, wanted to get what had happened to them off their chests. They were a normal family. A normal, scared family. And so, what would have been the purpose in perpetrating a hoax? There is no obvious answer. Of course, that is not to say that all of what has been discussed here is true, only that the reason why it might not be is not abundantly clear. Moreover, the similarities between their alleged abduction experience and those of others is, in short, astonishing. The most obvious, of course, is the Barney and Betty Hill incident of September 1961, during which an American couple driving back in their car to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, from a vacation in Niagara Falls and Montreal, at first witnessed a UFO before being abducted. The UFO, similar to the Avis family's testimonies, was said to have been bright and moving and the abduction, once again similar to the Avises, was revealed through hypnotic regression sessions. This creature, this leader is telling me something. He's telling you something. How is he getting it to you? I can see it in his face. His lips aren't moving. What did he tell you? Stay there and keep looking. Just keep looking. Could you hear him tell you? Oh, I got to pull these binoculars away from my eyes. Could you hear him tell you this? Oh, no, he didn't say it. You felt he said it. It's all right. I'll take you my head. This all boat. right. Pull the binoculars away. God, give me strength. Pull the binoculars down and run. God. Vivid recurring dreams odd buzzing sounds at home, and even thought transference communication with the beings who abducted them. Again, perhaps the Avises were seeking to imitate this high-profile case. But again, to what end? Most especially as, according to Andrew Collins, neither John nor Elaine had any knowledge of the Hill abduction. Another case of note in the Avely abduction is that of the Green Man of Ickley Moor. Taking place in December 1987, this story alleges an encounter with a small green being by a former police officer in open countryside in Yorkshire, England. The man is said to have been subsequently abducted, something which was only revealed under hypnosis after he was, like the Avis family, pursued by mysterious men in black. During his abduction, he, again similar to the Avises, was shown some manner of distressing film whilst on board an alien craft. Similar in theme to that which John and Elaine reported, the film supposedly contained lots of scenes of destruction, including starving people and waste going into rivers. The man is also reported to have been shown a second film by his abductors. However, when asked under hypnosis what the second film contained, he simply replied, I'm not supposed to tell anyone about the other film. It's not for them to know. Just as in John's experience, the beings, so it seemed, were able to influence and restrict the mind of someone they had abducted, even whilst in a hypnotically regressed state. Ultimately, like John and Elaine before him, this abductee chose to remain anonymous. He was not interested in fame and fortune, only in sharing an incredible and terrifying thing that had happened to him. And so, if one is to consider that these experiences have even a kernel of truth in them, you must forgive me for not buying the alleged alien story about them being here to help us. Time and time again, abduction experiences prove the opposite. Abductees, even if they claim to be privileged by what they have seen, are left traumatised, even making changes to their lifestyles, with environmentalism being the most popular. 
Indeed, those who have worked with alleged abductees in the capacity as therapists have been reporting this trend for decades, with it not unusual for abductees to uproot their lives in the aftermath of an experience, quite literally, in some cases, running off into the wilderness to start afresh as park rangers or environmental activists. Of course, as has been said, this may not be inherently unhealthy. But, all things considered, does make one wonder as to the true motives of these sinister, seemingly mind-controlling, shape-shifting, abducting entities. Physically weak, but mentally strong, it may be that by showing humans distressing films of destroyed planets whilst medically examining them and taking away their children, they are attempting to force an outcome that favours them, but ultimately not us a way to disarm, to erode their enemy before invasion. The precise details are ghastly to consider. Before concluding this case, I want to focus on what may be an overlooked detail in the Averly abduction. After all, it is easy, no doubt, to get lost in the sensational claims of tall beings and ugly furred examiners and impressive planetary holograms. Such makes it tempting to dismiss it all as nonsense. In this way, it is in the mundanity that we might find a slither of much needed realism. Describing his abduction experience to Andrew Collins, John said rather as a throwaway comment that the craft environment in which he found himself was rather bland. Everything was either colourless or grey. The lighting was low, and the only smell that he could remember was whilst he was being examined something akin to ozone, a gas with a distinctly pungent odour. Nothing more was said about this in Collins' report, and arguably, why should it have been elaborated upon? Details about the beings and what they were doing to the couple are arguably far more interesting. And yet, the smell of ozone can be said to be the mundane realism that those of us struggling to believe this case and wider abduction phenomenon may very well need. After all, given the context of the claim, that the Avis family were abducted, taken on board an alien vehicle that not only travelled across space at high, almost impossible speed, but was also capable of navigating the Earth's atmosphere at low orbit, a smell akin to ozone is highly relevant. As part of my ongoing research, I have spoken to an anonymous source with a US Air Force background, specifically in regards to space warfare, who claims that an ozone-like smell makes good sense in terms of extraterrestrial craft. In the course of our dialogue, they highlighted Invar, a nickel-iron alloy with anomalous thermal and magnetic properties, useful for aerostructure applications explaining how it produces an odd smell when mixed with the air or skin. According to their professional experiences, the closest thing this smell resembles is ozone, being very sharp, chemically, and not pleasant at all. Given the claim made by John and other abductees that these beings are able to travel very fast and in low orbit, it would make sense for their crafts to be constructed of or using materials with high dimensional stability. Invar, an alloy which demonstrates a relative lack of expansion or contraction with temperature changes, may be one such material, able to withstand the physical pressures that come with the high level of acceleration required for space travel and low Earth orbit. That John somehow knew this, mentioning the smell of ozone, can be said to be the detail that makes his testimony extremely compelling indeed. My contact also revealed, in cloaked and covert terms, that the US Air Force is already using this material in classified devices that are designed for low Earth orbit. And so, whatever these things are, and wherever they might come from, I would caution against disbelieving in all cases, most especially when the details are as specific and significant as this. It is unsettling, and perhaps easier and more desirable to turn away, but I am sorry to say that, given the current combined weight of inter, extra, ultra-terrestrial testimony, it may very well be the time to pull our heads from the sand and start paying attention to what is really going on around us.
The Coombs were an ordinary family, responsible for a herd of dairy cows living on a coastal clifftop farm in southwest Wales. They, Father Billy, Mother Pauline and their five children, prided themselves on having the down-to-earth basic values of farming folk. There was nothing strange or particularly exciting about their life. That was until one day in January 1977, when Pauline Coombs witnessed a bright and fiery light from her kitchen window. It was about a quarter of a mile away and hovered oddly over the field nearest the cliff edge. Swaying back and forth in the sky, gently and like a pendulum, it was undoubtedly peculiar a giant ball of fluorescent light with a tail of flame stretching out behind it. Transfixed by the sight, before Pauline knew it, the light fell, slowly at first, then faster, from the sky and down onto the coastal path. Horrified that something had just crashed, she sent her husband out to investigate. He, however, found nothing, and so returned to the farmhouse, dismissing the incident. The very next day, numerous unmarked army trucks, soldiers in camouflage uniforms, and about 50 frogmen arrived at the farm, wanting to investigate the coastal path near to where Pauline had seen the light drop from the sky. When asked what they were doing, they simply told the family that they were there to rebuild the coastal path after a landslide. When he tried to see what they were really doing, Billy, so he alleged, was prevented from getting any closer despite the military personnel being on his land. Such marked the beginning of a strange year for the Coombs family, and indeed the wider community around their farm. For Southwest Wales, according to their testimonies and local reports collated at the time, was visited by something otherworldly in 1977. Lights in the sky, strange aircraft, and even tall men, helmeted and dressed in silver suits. It was an invasion of sorts, with the invaders, those suited figures who stalked the fields of Ripperston Farm, feared to have come from the stars. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. The details of the Ripperston Farm case of alleged extraterrestrial interaction are, in short, phenomenal. It is rare to encounter a story that was not merely well documented at the time, with the testimonies of the family being recorded by multiple researchers, but is also supported by wider testimonies from the area. After all, there are scores of reports of unidentified flying objects, as well as descriptions of tall, spacesuit-wearing humanoids, dating from the time not only within the area of West Wales, but right across the United Kingdom with the reputable journal The Flying Saucer Review even going so far as to describe 1977 as the year of the Great United Kingdom wave. So captivated by this case was I during my research that I actually made the journey to Pembrokeshire, specifically the coastal path of St Bride's Bay, close to where Pauline and her family, as well as many others, are said to have witnessed both unexplained craft and figures. And so, if you would like to see some of what I got up to there, I invite you to click through to my recently launched second channel, Laura Routon, after this to watch that video. Before then, however, let us examine the details of this tremendous series of events. After Pauline's sighting of the giant ball of fluorescent light which fell from the sky on the 14th of January, the Coombs family did all that they could to dismiss the incident. As ever, there was work to be done on the farm, meaning there was no place for strangeness or silliness. Even so, the appearance of a vast number of military personnel on the coastal path of St Bride's the next day was unsettling, and in the words of the down-to-earth dairyman Billy, damn strange. What is more, over the next few weeks, further strangeness is said to have haunted the family. In particular, the household supposedly suffered many electrical problems. Fuses in farm machinery, including milking machines, repeatedly blew. Dozens of light bulbs exploded, sometimes immediately after they were put in. And impressively, two television sets overloaded in the space of two weeks, resulting in all their wiring being burned out. Five different repairmen were called to the farm, but the cause was a mystery, with the TVs being unable to be fixed. 
Consequently, the Coombs family got into somewhat of a habit of having repairmen and electricians come to Riverston Farm so as to attempt to fix their appliances and confirm that their electrical wiring was safe. According to The Uninvited, a book first published by Clive Harold Stutter in 1979 after interviewing the family so as to preserve their experiences, none of the tradespeople called to the farm were able to offer any sort of insight into why the malfunctions were happening. The possibility of rewiring the whole house was floated about, but more, it seems, in an act of desperation than anything that would have actually resolved the issues. For indeed, whilst more televisions continued to overload, the family's car, most certainly not wired into the rest of the house, also suffered electrical problems. Only a few weeks after the initial incident, Pauline was driving, along with three of her children, close to Little Haven, and the final three-mile stretch of gloomy country lane that would take them home to Riverston Farm. It was night, and it was against the black of the sky that a ten-year-old Kieran, one of the Coombs' sons, saw a peculiar light speed out of the darkness. The light was supposedly a fiery orange globe, about the size of a football, around a hundred yards away and no more than twelve feet off the road. Moving quickly, it looked to be travelling towards them as if it were about to collide with the car. Terrified, with her children, Kieran and his eight-year-old twin sisters Leanne and Joanne screaming in the passenger seats, Pauline put her foot down so as to accelerate under the seemingly falling object. And yet, it never hit them. The ball of light, so as described in The Uninvited, sped over them, shortly dazzling her and lighting the car up as it did. Watching through the back window of the car, Kieran then saw it stop and, bizarrely, change direction so as to follow the vehicle. Hedge-hopping alongside the car for more than a mile, Pauline was able to see it out of the driver's side window, with it maintaining both speed and direction with the car. It was said to have been like a gleaming orange football, dazzling bright with a white torch-like beam of light shining down from underneath it. As the by now horrified family approached the farm, the car's headlights are said to have started to dullen and ultimately fail, followed by the engine itself cutting out. When this happened, the orange light moved over the top of the car, illuminating the entire vehicle. With home in sight, Pauline and her children abandoned the car and ran to the house, screaming for Billy and their oldest son Clinton to help them. Rushing outside to investigate, they are said to have found the car bathed in a ray of white light emanating from the orange globe of light that hung motionless over it. It then supposedly moved off and vanished over the house and in the direction of the cliff edge. Speaking to the Western Telegraph about the happening on the 14th of April that same year, Pauline described how she and her family were all very frightened, especially the children who were in tears. And so it was that the light Pauline Coombs had first seen falling from the sky over the coastal path in January was now active, seemingly, on the roads around the family's farm. Before too long, it became clear to the family that these events were not merely sinister, but had no intention of stopping. After all, according to several incidents described in Clive Harold Stutter's The Uninvited, there was something inside of the Coombs' house. In one example, on the days that the television sets overloaded and broke, one of the family's daughters, Leanne, is said to have been disturbed, on both occasions, by a giant shadowy figure waking her in the night before drifting noiselessly out of the room across the landing. From there, it went into her parents' bedroom. When she later told this to her father, Billy told her what she had seen was not real and just a dream, and that she should stop scaring her siblings. And yet, there was plenty of other incidents to do the scaring for her, with even Clinton, her oldest brother and so we are led to believe, a sober, sensible and hard-working young man, reporting hearing strange noises in the farmhouse, including those which sounded like a generator just outside of the window whilst he was having a bath. The low pitch humming supposedly came through the closed window and filled the room around him causing him to jump out of the bath and flee in fear. Before too long, the entire family was on edge. Not merely that, they were experiencing behavioural changes also. 
Billy, usually cheerful, was often irritated and impatient. The children were becoming more and more withdrawn. Even the family's dog, a black Labrador called Blackie, was acting differently. Such reached a peak in the spring of 1977 when, one night around midnight, as Pauline and Billy were watching a film together in the living room, the animal became restless. According to the narrative presented in the 1979 book The Uninvited, and also via Pauline's December 1977 interview with BBC News reporter David Allen, Billy had fallen asleep whilst watching the film. Pauline continued to watch alone, but struggled to pay attention to the television on account of first their dog's behaviour and second, the appearance of lights akin to car headlights outside the window, seemingly coming down their driveway. There was no sound associated with the lights, with them simply stopping some distance away, not coming any closer to the house. Such caused a constant flickering in the window. Given the time of day and the rural location of the farm, Pauline could not understand why there would be lights outside the house. Regardless, she chose to ignore them and tried to watch the film to its end. Close to 1am, Billy is said to have awoken. Upon catching sight of the window, he was horrified. Far from there simply being the lights Pauline had previously seen, there was allegedly a towering humanoid figure standing in the window. So much bigger than a man, the figure is said to have been about seven feet tall and the width of the window, which is three feet wide. Such an intimidating size meant that neither Billy nor Pauline could see the top of the figure, with only the bottom of its head visible to them. It was wearing a helmet, its visor presenting a blacked out face. As for the rest of it, its body, possibly suited, was said to be silver and glowing. Pauline was instructed to run upstairs to check on the children. Meanwhile, Billy scrambled for the telephone, watching in horror as the otherworldly being moved so as to press an outstretched gloved hand against the window. Its palm to the glass, the lights in the house then began to flicker, as did the television, with even the window pane itself supposedly vibrating. All the while, the family's dog is said to have crouched in the corner, howling in absolute instinctual terror, teeth bared. All Billy could do was watch, disbelieving and paralysed with fear, willing first his neighbour and then the police to pick up the phone. By the time the neighbouring farmer and two young Broadhaven constables arrived, the figure was gone. The only traces of the silver-suited man to be found were giant footprints in the flower bed, as well as the scorched remnants of a rose bush beside the window, proving, seemingly, that whatever had been standing there had not only been enormous, but also capable of killing the plant merely by standing in close proximity to it. Speaking to the BBC later in the year, Pauline affirmed that the appearance of the figure at the family's window was undoubtedly the most terrifying experience of it all. Unfortunately for the Coombs, this would not be the only time that they saw a silver-suited figure on their farm. Sometime after the window sighting, the twins Leanne and Joanne are said to have rushed into the house, reporting to have seen someone dressed in silver, very tall with a helmet and a blacked out face at the bottom of one of the farm's fields. They had been playing together outside when they saw the figure floating, supposedly, across the ground towards them and through the hedge. Terrified, the girls followed the figure into the next field, only to witness an enormous silver saucer thing with lights and windows all around it and a kind of ladder coming from a door. It is implied that the helmet-wearing humanoid left via this ship, which the Coombs twins observed rising from the ground before joining a bigger saucer in the sky. Together, the two unidentified ships are said to have flown away very fast and without any noise across the field and towards the cliff edge. Allegedly, despite being said to have floated, yet more giant footsteps were discovered, observed by Pauline and others with there being two normal human paces between each oversized print. A scorched circle of grass at least 50 feet in diameter was also discovered where the ship was claimed to have stood. Later that same day, Pauline apparently saw the figure again from a window in the house. 
Described in the uninvited, it is said to have lurked just beyond the illuminated part of the lawn, in the dark of the driveway. Again, tall, silver, luminous, it was unmistakable as the same figure as the others which had been seen around the farm. Glowing eerily in the dark, Pauline claimed that it floated slowly up the drive and past the house, with its arms rigidly at its sides. She watched it for a brief moment, after which it disappeared into the dark. Eerily the next morning, Pauline is said to have woken to find her arm inflamed, swollen and irritated and difficult to move. Not only that, she had woken late, something highly uncharacteristic for the young farmer's wife, being overwhelmed by feelings of fatigue. When her family saw her injury, her daughter Leanne spoke of how she had supposedly once again seen something strange wandering the farmhouse at night. Similar to the giant shadowy figure which had disturbed her at the start of the year, she claimed to have seen a silver hand drift through the door and into her mother's bedroom. Her father, Billy, had been tending to a heifer that night, and so little Leanne had been sleeping in bed with her mother. The disembodied silver hand reportedly drifted over to Pauline and touched her arm. Such was, so the girl claimed, the cause of her mother's injury. It is said that it took three weeks for Pauline's arm to heal. Without a doubt, these claims are sensational. The frequent appearance of humanoids is one thing, their ability to enter the Coombs family home and cause injury to them is another. And yet they, the Coombs, were not the only people in the area to report encounters with such entities. Incredibly, and most certainly chillingly, reports from the time in publications including Flying Saucer Review proved that they were not alone in their claims. For example, in an edition published in June 1977, the journal details how, on the 17th of March, on the northeast side of St. Bride's Bay, a 17-year-old Stephen Taylor saw a tall male figure standing by a farm gate. The figure was, so the young man reported, wearing a sort of semi-transparent suit. Upon being spotted, the strange humanoid is then said to have approached Taylor, thoroughly terrifying him and causing him to flee home. Earlier that same night, Taylor had supposedly seen a strange light in the sky, a pear drop shape of glowing orange, somewhat reminiscent of that which Pauline spotted earlier that year in January. Then again, this time in an edition published in August, there was a highly detailed interview with Rosa Grenville, the owner of the Haven Fort Hotel, who claimed to have observed two long-legged figures standing beside a UFO in the field beside her home. It was around two in the morning on the 19th of April 1977, and the figures were said to have been six and a half or seven foot tall and dressed head to toe in a sort of white plasticated suit. They, so the hotel owner explained to her interviewers, had longish arms because they seemed to be measuring something outside of the craft. Watching via a pair of binoculars from her window, Granville saw them climb the bankside, turning round and observing. Unsettlingly, the figures were said to have had no features at all. Both simply possessed a blank face. No eyes, no mouths, nothing. When they were finished, they returned to the craft, which lifted and shot off into the night sky and across the bay. It is unclear for how long the hotel owner observed the strange scene, however, one intriguing and undoubtedly unsettling detail is that both her bedside radio, plugged into the mains power, and her mechanical bedside clock stopped running on the night of the encounter. The time at which they stopped was 3.30 am. Even one of Pauline Coombs' young family members, her 11-year-old nephew, Mark Marston, is said to have seen a silver-suited, helmet-wearing figure who drifted through a closed farm gate. The boy was left terrified, and was most certainly, according to his parents, not one to make up stories. He had, after all, screamed and cried all the way home. And so, adults and children alike seem to have witnessed odd humanoids, with perhaps the most famous of the related sightings being those which came from the nearby Broadhaven School. 
Early on in the year, on Friday the 4th of February, some 15 school children are said to have observed not merely a UFO, which supposedly landed near their school, but also at least one man come from it wearing a silver suit and being generally very scary. According to a nine-year-old Jeremy Passmore, we felt very scared. One of his friends, another nine-year-old called David George, wanted someone to go to the toilet with him afterwards out of fear. With another boy again, Tudor Owen Lloyd-Jones, aged 10, nearly crying because he was so scared that he was going to be disintegrated. Another child again is claimed to have been so fear-gripped that he injured his leg after he fell whilst running away. One would think that the boys had truly seen something strange in order to warrant such a hysterical response. Thus, it is clear that the Coombs family were not the only ones within the St. Bride's Bay area to experience the strange and quite possibly otherworldly that year. Indeed, a rich tapestry of related testimonies are easily uncovered when one knows where to look with it being quite impossible to document all that happened in 1977 within a single video. Even when focusing on the Coombs themselves, it is difficult to surmise just how much the family experienced over the course of the year. For, by December and the ultimate conclusion of the phenomena, they had endured all manner of electrical anomalies at the farm. Several encounters, both distant and close, with strange, seemingly extraterrestrial, silver-suited figures, abundant sightings of ships and lights in the sky, large circular scorch marks in their fields, bumps and bangs throughout the house, and inexplicable behavioural changes within the family. It is even claimed that the Coombs were forced to put their dog to sleep after he was driven insane by what he had seen at the window of the house. His behaviour, so the author of The Uninvited relayed, became progressively more erratic and unpredictable after the shocking nighttime incident, with him running in circles, snarling and howling each night, looking to where the figure had been. The animal was, so we are told, destroyed by the otherworldly sighting. And Blackie was not the only animal on the farm to be affected. It is also recorded that the Coombs' livelihood, their herd of dairy cows, suffered, with them, the entire herd, being somehow teleported on and off the farm by mysterious lights. No doubt this is a highly dubious claim, and yet many, including the naturally sceptic Billy, as well as other farmers in the area who found the relocated cows rampaging through their fences and fields, attested to the, at one point, irritatingly frequent happening. No amount of locks or chains could, so it is reported, keep the bovine in their barn. They would be found elsewhere, transported within a matter of seconds, even after Billy had just rounded them up and returned them from a previous teleportation. During one tragic occurrence, on the 10th of September 1977, an allegedly teleported cow died after becoming entangled in an electric fence. Chillingly, the stakes of the case are said to have risen even further with the arrival of strange men at Ripperston Farm. Recorded in Clive Harold Stutter's The Uninvited, the Coombs family spoke of the day Pauline returned home to find her and Billy's eldest son, Clinton, cowering inside the house. White as a sheet and looking badly shaken, he was reluctant to open the door for his mother, with the safety chain engaged. Apparently, so Clinton explained, two men had arrived at the farm. They had only just left, and yet Pauline had not passed anyone on the driveway. Explaining further, the unsettled young man supposedly told his mother that the men weren't really men. They had not been, so he stated, human. Said to have pulled up to the farmhouse in an enormous silver car, one had stayed in the vehicle while the other approached the house. Clinton had been able to see both, and they were eerily identical. Both with dark coloured suits on, both very tall and thin, both with dark slicked back hair and abnormally large foreheads. The one who walked up to the house, so Clinton explained, glided rather than walked. He had hardly been moving his arms and looked, according to the terrified young man, entirely wrong. It was like an illusion, he said. Locking the doors to the house, Clinton had retreated upstairs and continued to watch the odd visitor from the window. The dark-suited figure had then tried to open the front and then the back door to the house. 
unable to gain access, he had then, watched by Clinton from upstairs, proceeded to the little cottage adjacent to the farmhouse. This building was rented by a lady called Carol, who had, aside from reading the local news coverage related to the happenings, been largely disconnected from the otherworldly events at Ripperston Farm. That was until that moment. Explaining what she had experienced to Pauline, Carol explained that the man, who arrived, so she said, in the fabulous looking car, had been looking for her, for Pauline. Supposedly speaking to Carol in a very flat, expressionless voice, the man in black had asked when Pauline was expected to arrive home. Carol had simply stated that she didn't know. I didn't trust him, she is recorded as having said in Stutter's book. After all, the man is said to have really frightened her. Not only had he seemingly manifested at the lady's side, startling her, he had also looked strange, with a really high forehead, glazed, unblinking eyes, and skin that appeared to be wax-like, plastic somehow, absolutely smooth, shiny looking. After telling him that Pauline was not home, the man had left, with him, as Carol turned to enter her cottage, simply disappearing from sight. Bizarrely, later that same day, Rosa Grenville, the owner of the Havenfort Hotel, who claimed to have witnessed strange suited figures on the grass outside her house only a few months earlier, was likewise visited by dark suited men. The same as Pauline Coombs, she had not been home at the time, meaning that her daughter had been alone when they arrived. One stayed in the car, one approached the house. He was looking for Rosa, did the daughter know when her mother might be home? Thoroughly frightened, the daughter had expressed to her mother that there had been something fundamentally wrong with the visitors. The same as Clinton Coombs, she had been convinced that the men, with their large foreheads, waxy skin, and piercing eyes, had not been human. When Rosa later contacted their Member of Parliament about the matter, he, who subsequently made inquiries with the local RAF base and the Ministry of Defence, was unable to find any records to suggest anything unusual had happened in the area. And so, the Coombs, the Grenvilles, and others who lived within reach of the St. Bride's Bay coastal path continued to live in fear of the lights, the figures, and now the otherworldly men in black who seemed to be stalking the area. Then, on the 12th of November, 1977, the case is said to have reached a tremendous peak. Driving home, Pauline, her eldest daughter Tina, and her parents are said to have witnessed an enormous silver disc, just hanging in the sky, quite motionless, the sun reflecting slightly from its burnished surface, making it shine. They were close to the farm, and watched the peculiar object sway like a pendulum in the sky above them after which it flew away towards the cliff edge. It then, so the family claimed, plunged down towards the outcrop of rocks just beyond the cliff. Pauline and her family braced for an explosion, but none came, and so she, along with all five of her children, hurried to the coastal path so as to investigate. Looking out over the sea, their attention was drawn to stack rocks, the rocky outcrop which the silver disc had seemingly flown in the direction of. There, so they sensationally claimed, they observed a tall, silver-suited figure standing on the rocks. Shrouded in shadow, standing higher up on the rock was a second figure. As Pauline and Clinton looked more closely, they realised that the shadow was actually no shadow at all, but, so they alleged, a doorway. When the second silver-suited figure moved out of the shadow, it somehow moved, thinning out, until it disappeared. In its place, so is recorded in the book on the case, was a perfectly flat, metal-looking surface, glinting slightly in the sun. Incredibly, it appeared to be some manner of sliding door built into the surface of the rock. Below was darkness. Presumably, the enormous silver disc had entered the rock via this door, suggesting the existence of some manner of aircraft hangar or base hidden within stack rocks. Utterly bewildered and increasingly terrified as to why all of this was happening only a short distance from their home, the Coombs could do nothing other than walk back to the farmhouse. For the next few weeks, the activity continued. The family's cows were repeatedly teleported from their barn and pastures, and yet more figures and strange lights were seen. 
The Coombs feared that the beings responsible, whoever or whatever they were, were studying not merely the cows, but them as well, and that they were powerless to prevent any of it. On the morning of the 18th of December, Pauline even awoke to find a puncture-like blemish on her forearm. That night, she supposedly experienced an odd dream that seemed to suggest she had been transported to some other place. A bed in some sort of domed room with an enormous screen on one wall and different coloured flashing lights, with the subsequent mark highly suggestive of an abduction experience. The very next day, the activity, which had started 11 months before, came to an end. Driving home in the dark after visiting Pauline's parents, the Coombs were shocked to see an enormous ball of bright orange light with all the size and brilliance of the sun suspended motionless over the cowsheds. Just like the other lights they had seen, it swayed from side to side like a luminous pendulum. Was it about to abduct the cows? Was this the light responsible for their teleportations? However, before they were able to find out the answer to their questions, the light, with frightening suddenness, streaked off, up and away from them, diminishing in size as it went, until it was barely as big as a distant planet. And so they, the uninvited visitors who had first arrived at Ripperston in January, were gone. After that, so we are led to believe, the family never saw nor encountered anything unusual at the farm again. Truly, the case of Ripperston Farm is exceptional, not merely because of the detailed testimonies of the Coombs family, but because of the wider network of statements from others such as Rosa Grenville from the Havenfort Hotel and the children of the Broadhaven School. Speaking of the reliability of the family's statements, researcher and author Clive Harold Stutter, who we must thank for having travelled to meet the family so as to safeguard their stories for future generations in his book, was convinced of their genuineness. At first reticent and reluctant to engage with the press, Billy and Pauline were frightened of all that they had experienced. But, given its repeated and extensive nature, felt as though they were obligated to share their story. After all, as Stutter points out, there were so very many similar sightings in the area that, in May 1977, a Ministry of Defence spokesman was forced to release a statement to the British press admitting that they had indeed received reports of sightings of unexplained objects in the West Wales area and the people who have reported these sightings are genuinely sincere people, genuinely concerned. We, so the spokesman confirmed, investigate every report on this assumption, and we do not discount the possibility of intelligent life in outer space. Such can be said to be quite an out of character and quite possibly even embarrassing statement for a military department to make. They knew there were sightings and, as far as they were willing to admit, they were not responsible for them and were, presumably, powerless against them. And certainly, from what we are led to believe via the Coombs' testimonies, the military was very much interested in what was going on in and around the St. Bride's Bay area, with Billy Coombs even stating that he had been ushered off his own land by army personnel and naval frogmen after Pauline saw the light fall from the sky and onto the coastal path in January. They had arrived the very next day and wanted first dibs, so it seemed, on whatever had fallen from the sky. And yet, pursuing this lead, Clive Harold Stutter was unable to uncover anything of significance, with the Undersecretary for the MOD writing to say that they had no record of any unusual activity in the area. This was in spite of the claim made by one of the Coombs' neighbours that, after her sighting, an officer from the nearby now-defunct Broady RAF base had not merely interviewed her, but also asked to keep their conversation secret. And so, the possibility of military involvement, either in researching the unidentified objects or being responsible for them directly, must be considered. After all, according to Rosa Grenville of the Havenfort Hotel, when she saw the oval object and suited figures on the grass outside her home early one April morning, they were close to, so it is described in a Flying Saucer Review article, an unusual concrete structure belonging to the Ministry of Defence, whose purpose we are still investigating through parliamentary channels. 
It is unclear if the journal's researchers were able to ascertain this information, but it is interesting to note nonetheless. Undoubtedly, there was a strong military presence in the area at the time of the sightings and encounters. In the opening chapter of The Uninvited, we are regaled with a long list of military installations, including a tank range, a submarine tracking station, and a missile range within a 20-mile radius of Ripperston Farm. And yet, we are equally assured that Pauline Coombs, not to mention others within the area, were quite used to seeing every conceivable sort of light in the sky, everything from flares to fighter jets and missiles, but never anything like this. She would not, she was certain, be so easily confused. Unless, of course, the things that she and other witnesses had seen in the sky were some manner of new and secretive military project which would, naturally, explain the MOD's reluctance to admit the existence of any records. In this way, the subsequent drama surrounding accusations of trickery can be said to become all the more intriguing. In the early 1980s, debunkers, including strikingly RAF police, stated that hoaxers dressed in silver-lined asbestos suits were responsible for the sightings of supposed spacemen at Ripperston Farm, Broadhaven School, and the Haven Fort Hotel. They had, so researchers, including Hilary Evans, claimed, borrowed the suits from local oil refinery workers for a fancy dress evening in Broadhaven shortly after the children's sighting, subsequently going on some manner of rampage throughout the area, trudging across acres of empty farmland so as to frighten anyone they came across. It is even said that, in 1996, a BBC presenter was able to track down one of these tricksters for a Radio 4 documentary on the West Wales UFO flap. Another, a local man called Glyn Edwards, even confessed to having had to have jumped into a hedge after a lady, who later called the police, aimed a shotgun at him after he came into her garden so as to frighten her. And yet, whilst these claims and confessions might most certainly be true in some cases, they do not explain the other phenomena alleged in connection with the silver-suited humanoid sightings. For example, the rattling of the windows and electrical anomalies experienced by the Coombs when they observed their seven-foot-tall visitor at their downstairs window. Surely this was something more than a prankster in a suit. Moreover, regardless of how convincingly terrifying such a suited hoaxer might be, I am quite certain they would not be able to relocate 100 cows in a matter of seconds. Neither would they be capable of appearing as a disembodied hand scuttling across the bedroom of Pauline Coombs, nor, of course, able to present themselves many feet off the ground as an enormous and illuminated silver disc in the night sky. Then, critically, the so-called debunkers claim that the suits were borrowed after the schoolboys saw their spaceman, suggesting the suit borrowing, if even true, was a reaction to the earlier sighting, and not the cause. Further sceptical considerations which could help to explain, at least in part, some of the 1977 sightings, for example those of the Broadhaven schoolchildren, might be found in the pop culture of the time, specifically episodes of the television programme Doctor Who. Undoubtedly a cultural phenomenon, even today, in the 1970s Doctor Who was even more so, with its episodes attracting in excess of 12 million viewers. By comparison, recent episodes, with the UK possessing a larger population now, attract on average a mere 3 to 4 million. On the 29th of January 1977, only a few days before the school children's sighting on the 4th of February, part one of the Robots of Death episodes was released. Might it be that the children, who were aged between 9 and 11, were left terrified, as was common, by this Doctor Who episode? leading them to think that they saw, either as a misidentification of something else or as part of a game of make-believe, a silver-suited robot man in the field outside their school. It is worth considering. And yet again, all of this, as convincing as it might sound to the sceptically minded on its own, does little to explain the wider phenomena reported throughout the year. And such simple explanations can be said to look less and less convincing the more one considers the wider phenomena. Most striking is how, when one does wider research, it becomes clear that all of this was by no means limited to South West Wales. 
only early the very next year, with the sighting dating to the 2nd of January 1978, the British UFO Research Association reported how a human-like figure, some six to seven feet tall, dressed in a pure white one-piece suit and helmet, was spotted by four men on the outskirts of Liverpool. Very similar to those reported by the Coombs, the humanoid's arms were said to have hung motionless at its sides before beginning to walk towards the car in which the terrified men sat. After fleeing in fear, the police were involved, with them confirming that none of the witnesses were intoxicated, and that no trace of the odd humanoid could be found. Given that Rainford, where the figure was sighted, is some 200 miles from St. Bride's, it is highly unlikely that Glyn Edwards and his suit-borrowing buddies were responsible for this sighting. And then, of course, there is the infamous case of All Colours Sam, the bizarre Sandown clown, again suited and helmeted, said to have been encountered by two children on the Isle of Wight in 1973. Looking further into the future, one can even draw similarities between what the Coombs family claim to have experienced at their farm with that which the Andrews family experienced at theirs in the 1980s, when they were stalked by lights and figures which they ominously referred to as the Watchers. Of course, none of this is to say that what the Coombs or indeed anyone else saw was extraterrestrial in nature. There is not enough evidence to get anywhere close to saying that. Rather, these points are made to showcase how simple explanations, here the accusation of asbestos suit trickery, are equally limited in terms of dismissing what are undoubtedly complex and unusual happenings. It should also be clear that all these similar testimonies being one big coincidence, the blank check so favoured by obstinately close-minded disbelievers and material fundamentalists just doesn't work in this case. There is simply too much, too much even to be covered and considered in this video. Something unusual, whatever it may have been, happened in the area around St. Bride's Bay in 1977. And so, I shall end by inviting you to reflect upon it for yourselves, and to draw your own conclusions as to what the Coombs, and the Grenvilles, and the school children of Broadhaven School, and all the others combined saw encountered and experienced in 1977. The Welsh county of Pembrokeshire has a wide and weird history of extraterrestrial visitation. In 1977, the Coombs family, as well as many others in the St. Bride's Bay area, reported witnessing and indeed interacting with strange space-suited figures. There were also claims of UFOs, ET haunted schools, livestock teleportations, and even alien abduction. In time, the reports died down, and yet it cannot be said that the strangeness ever really left the area. After all, odd sightings continued, with Milford Haven and Pembroke Dock seated on opposite sides of the estuary, the former a mere seven miles as the crow flies from the E.T. synonymous St. Bride's, attracting numerous reports of UFOs and other odd happenings over the years. As recently as February 2022, a peculiar blue object was seen and photographed several hundred feet up in the air above the Pembroke refinery from Milford Haven. Then, a few years earlier in 2009, there were countless sightings of similar unidentified flying objects, with it even reported that over 20 witnesses at Pembroke Docks Hobbs Point saw an unusual orange ball navigating the estuary. This orange ball, described as a large, fiery mass in other sightings, was also seen by a woman known as Susan. Unlike many others who witnessed the same phenomenon, she was not left in awe or desirous to find out more about what she had seen. Rather, she was terrified. After all, that evening, sitting in her boyfriend's car, eating fast food whilst looking out over the estuary from Hobbs Point, had been arranged to serve as a distraction from the other strange and horrifying things slowly devouring her life. For indeed, only three days prior, Susan had encountered an alien being. A tall, black, skinny figure that woke her in the early hours of the morning, abducted her, and even so she claimed, killed, then stole the corpse of her friend's dog. The orange ball of fire was, so she thought, connected, 
and along with other horrific incidents, would continue to plague her for the next several years, ultimately leading her to conclude that humankind is slowly being harvested by a monstrous, careless, unceasing alien race. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Susan's story truly begins with G. L. Davies, a Pembrokeshire native born in 1975 with a lifelong interest in the paranormal. The author of several best-selling books discussing local hauntings, he, in 2014, decided to turn his eye to the UFO phenomenon, specifically in regards to the aforementioned 1970s West Wales flap. Hoping to get in contact with anyone who could remember the original happenings, he was surprised when Susan, a woman in her mid-twenties who was not old enough to fit this requirement, responded to his advertisement. Regardless, he agreed to meet with her, hoping she would lead him to an older relative or neighbour with a story to tell. And yet, sitting in an idyllic riverside coffee shop in Haverford West, Davies soon realised it was her own story that she had come to share. She was, so she claimed, the victim of something much more recent, and in many ways, much more sinister than anything that had happened in the 70s. And so, changing course, Davies decided to pursue Susan's dark and terrible story, a decision which, in October 2014, took him to her home for what would be the first of many interviews, which he would ultimately publish in his true story book, Harvest. It was November, over five years ago, Susan is said to have told the author. A student at university, living with her aunt, she happily agreed to spend the night with three friends for movies and a few bottles of Rioja out in the countryside. Her friend's parents were away on holiday, and so they had the old stone farmhouse all to themselves. Four young women, her friend's dog Lenny, and plenty of girlish chatter. At some point in the night, Susan went upstairs to use the bathroom. As she did, she noticed through the skylight what appeared to be the headlights of a car coming down the long and bumpy track which led to the farmhouse. Watching the lights through the window, she saw them stop and then, oddly, turn off. At the very same moment, the light in the bathroom is also said to have gone off. Outside the door, she could hear the dog barking and her friends moving and shouting all the power in the house having gone out. Susan hurried to finish in the dark, and yet, before she was able to do so, a bright white light is said to have appeared, suddenly and fiercely from above through the skylight. Indeed, it was so bright that she claimed to have had to cover her eyes. Presuming it to be a helicopter, perhaps one investigating the source of the power cut, she thought little of it. That was until she went downstairs and her friends asked her if she was okay. She had been in the bathroom for 15 minutes. Susan, however, was adamant she had only taken five at the very maximum. Upon checking her mobile phone for the time, she found it was turned off. Indeed, all four of the young women's phones had, alongside the electricity, turned off. Even so, Susan was quick to dismiss the oddity. The power and the phones were turned back on, no car ever arrived along the long rural driveway, and the girls enjoyed the rest of their evening. They went to bed around 2am. It was decided that Susan would sleep in the converted barn for the night, only a few footsteps from the main farmhouse, with Lenny the dog for company. Like the farmhouse, the building had skylights, and so she settled into the warmth of the barn apartment, poured herself a tall glass of water for her bedside table, and went to sleep. According to the testimony recorded by G. L. Davies, she woke at 3.18 am. There was, she claimed, someone else in the room with her. Lenny the dog was fast asleep on the bed, and yet, beyond, at the foot of it, she could sense someone stood there in the darkness. She had not heard, for example, one of her friends come in the front door and up the stairs. Rather, she had simply woken, and felt as though someone was already in the room with her. I thought I could make out something moving, she explained to the author. It was something small, almost as though there was a child, slender, three feet tall, watching her in the dark as she slept. Panicking, Susan then described sitting up, at which point a bright white light filled the room. 
It was the same as the light she had experienced in the bathroom earlier in the evening, and caused her friend's dog to wake and jump off the bed. The animal was barking, clearly also sensing the strange figure in the room. Things were being knocked over, and all Susan could focus on was an intense pain in her head. Then, there was a blue, smoky flash which momentarily illuminated the room. In that second of light, she allegedly saw the dog attacking a tall, black, skinny figure. A second flash, a high-pitched ringing, a howl of pain, and finally, an inhuman scream, then she saw the dog again, this time crumpled as a motionless heap on the floor. Another flash, and he was gone. When the final blue flash came, Susan screamed. The figure was mere inches from her, its black, featureless face very almost touching hers. After that, she must have, somehow, fallen back asleep, for the next she remembered she was waking up again. It was quarter to eight in the morning, and she felt terrible. Her head hurt, she had a pain behind her right eye, cramps in her stomach, and a sharp, piercing pain in the back. The nightmare at least was over. And yet, when she looked for Lenny the dog, she couldn't find him. He was missing, and despite her and her friends searching the entire farm for him, he was never seen again. And so it was that Susan sat in her apartment with the author G. L. Davies, is said to have claimed that some manner of faceless being had killed her friend's dog, the animal having rushed to protect her and his home from the insidious, intruding figure. She of course had no proof, and indeed spoke of how her friends drifted away from her in the aftermath of this incident, quietly believing that Susan, through drunken carelessness, had somehow lost her friend's beloved family pet. And certainly, maybe the young woman would have come to convince herself of this too, if it had not been for all that happened next. Unable to shake what happened that night, Susan's health, mental and physical, began to decline rapidly. Describing herself as incredibly ill, she suffered nosebleeds, a continuation of the pain behind her eye, stomach cramps and bowel problems. Debilitated and depressed, it was as though she were in the grip of some terrible drug. Her doctor suggested she might have an iron deficiency, and yet supplements did little to help. Above all, however, she feared going to sleep. What if the haunting dream sequence returned? And so, wanting to take her mind off it, she arranged to go on a date with a young man she was seeing at the time. That evening, they bought fast food, and drove to Pembroke Dock, specifically a little car park called Hobbs Point. There, they could sit in the car and eat, watching the estuary and the lights of the boats bobbing in the water, the Pembroke oil refinery and its lights in the distance. It was that evening that Susan, along with her date, saw the anomalous bright orange light. At first distant, it is said to have grown bigger and bigger until it became clear to both Susan and her boyfriend that it was on course to collide with the car. Describing its appearance, Susan said it seemed almost to be a flame, like it was a ball of fire trapped in a glass ball. There was static electricity in the air inside the car, and then, just before impact, the ball of light suddenly came to a standstill. It hovered over the car, then shot off at great speed down the estuary towards the bridge. The encounter only lasted a few seconds, and yet it was so bizarre and frightening that it put an end to Susan's night. Thoroughly horrified, she went home. Using the information provided in the book, Susan's sighting appears to date to November 2008. According to the author, there were other sightings of unusual activity on the estuary that night. In the aftermath of that odd happening, Susan's health is said to have continued to decline. Living with her aunt, due to her useful proximity to both Susan's university and part-time job, she suffered largely in silence, her friends and now boyfriend distanced from her. Not only that, she began to suffer terrible nightmares. In G. Al Davis' book, Susan's nightmares are described in great detail. In particular, she claimed to have had three terrible nights, each with a terrible dream. She would find herself walking along the high street of Haverford West, the town in which she and her aunt lived together. Drawn to a particular pub, she would enter each time and converse with various people, including, she claims, a younger incarnation of herself. 
She would be asked questions, some of them eerie, including if she had a baby, would she love it more than her own life, and whether or not she would kill a man to protect herself. Most chillingly, however, when Susan awoke from these dreams, she would be in agony. She had awful pains in her stomach and an excruciating headache. The first night when she rose from bed to use the bathroom, she even alleged that she encountered a skinny, faceless black figure. It touched the side of her head with a black metal claw-like hand, at which point she screamed and blacked out. The shadow man was gone when she next awoke. That night, she claimed she slept for 13 hours, and yet woke utterly exhausted. The second night, however, is said to have been the worst. After she woke, at first unable to move, with what she said was a huge pressure on her chest, Susan looked through her open bedroom door and across the hallway to her aunt's room. She was asleep in bed, her pet cat likewise resting. There was also, so Susan has claimed, a third figure in the room some manner of large, bulbous, transparent mass, somewhat akin to a jellyfish with lights in its body, flashing reds, yellows, and blues. It was supported by incredibly thin, segmented legs, like the legs of an insect, and stood on top of Susan's aunt. When it got close to her face, it is reported to have touched her, two long, thin, vein-like tendrils emerging from the area where its head should have been, so as to enter the sleeping woman's nose. The other moved to the sleeping cat, lifting it into the air. The tendril had entered the animal's mouth. According to Susan, the feline did not wake during the nighttime violation. Her aunt, however, did. She screamed, and then Susan could remember no more. The next morning, she claimed both her aunt and the cat were tremendously ill with the animal tragically passing the next day. And so, according to the young woman, her odd, night-creeping creatures had taken a second animal victim. A chilling and sensational claim indeed. And so, at this point in the story, it should be said that much of what is asserted in G. L. Davies' book comes only from his anonymous interviews with the young woman he refers to as Susan and that even then, a large part of her testimony is drawn from dream scenes and solitary experiences. Naturally, this is problematic in terms of verification. How do we know the cat's death was caused by some manner of sinister alien interaction? We do not have a body. We do not even have a video or photograph. And so, we simply do not know. Of course, according to Davies, Susan was a highly articulate, sober and intelligent young woman. He got the sense that she very much believed and was still deeply traumatized by the events she relayed to him. These were memories and not made up. Regardless, it may be more usual in cases such as this to disregard the story altogether. How can any serious researcher be so generous as to entertain something with little to no backing? And yet, this story, and the book in which it has been published, has been widely read and accepted by the UFO community. Many believe there is something to it, and that Susan's story still has a value. After all, some of the details she is said to have shared with Davies have been reported in other, better documented cases. Discussing her nightmares, she explained to the author that, at the end of the dreams, she found herself in a cinema, unable to move, forced to watch a series of disturbing clips. First, she had seen insects devouring each other in graphic detail. On another occasion, the videos had been of the local area, and people dying in a disaster. Horrific, elongated scenes of a man melting like wax, and an elderly woman screaming as her car smashed into other cars on the road, as all around there were explosions. Broken buildings, wreckage, devastating disaster. Mothers and their children consumed by fire, and there were parts of people scattered across the screen. Intriguingly, similar scenes of disaster have been reported by other alleged alien abductees. And so, is there a link here which supports Susan's story? Perhaps. It can also be said to be interesting how Susan allegedly discovered, as the film continued, the cause of the disaster. 
the oil refinery situated on the Pembrokeshire coast, visible from the estuary and its towns. It had, she concluded, exploded, making her wonder whether or not her experience was some manner of premonition, a warning of dark days to come. Strangely, the refinery and the estuary are places where many have witnessed UFOs, including Susan's orange ball of fire and the blue object photographed in 2022. Not only that, two and a half years after Susan's disturbing dream, an explosion at the refinery claimed the lives of four workers. By no means the scale of the scenes reported by Susan, but still quite possibly supportive of its disastrous potential. And so, if Susan's story had ended here, we might find ourselves left with a sensational but still somewhat compelling case. However, it does not. Instead, the three dream sequence can be said to signal a watershed, after which this case goes far beyond the usual in regards to alien abduction. Now, supposedly having been interviewed by the author over a series of days, Susan describes moving back to live with her parents after her aunt fell ill. The nightmares, as well as physical symptoms, are said to have continued, with her doctor unable to offer any sort of explanation beyond an iron deficiency. Meanwhile, her aunt, at a distance, continued to decline, with both women becoming more and more socially withdrawn. Before too long, her aunt, like the dog and cat before her, died, her body riddled with sudden and aggressive cancer. Presumably, her nighttime interaction with the jellyfish alien was to blame. As for Susan, she suffered further nightmares, including those in which she found herself in a field with other women, young and old, all of them naked and entranced as they walked together like a herd of cattle towards an intense red light. Whenever she would wake up, she would be, so she explained, oddly calm, like she had been sedated. Then, one evening when driving home, she experienced the nightmare again. Only this time, it wasn't actually a nightmare. Forced to break when she encountered a fox standing in the middle of the road, Susan next remembered stepping out of some woodland, the sky above her red. It was vivid, not a dream, but real, and she was naked and confused. She thought maybe she had been in a car accident, and so hurried through the night, scrambling up a hill in search of the road and her car. Instead, she found a field of tall grass and other naked women. Just as confused as she was, they supposedly came together and formed a group. An older lady, an elderly lady, a blind German woman, and even a little girl no more than five or six, whom Susan carried through the grass. This was very real, she told her interviewer. Although the situations and locations were the same as the dreams, this experience was said to have been intensely different. And so, she claimed, she and the others walked across the field together, under the red glow of the sky and an unseen light source. As they moved towards the horizon, panic supposedly set in. There were, so Susan said, women being sucked into the sky, rising and spinning, being abducted up into an unseen craft. There was blackness, and then Susan found herself in a large room. There were innumerable naked women around her, in dozens of single-file lines being, what can only be described as, processed by alien beings. Despite wanting to run, she was unable. Susan also, so she told the author, found that she couldn't speak. Her mouth had been taped up with a skin-coloured plastic that did not have an overlap, but was, instead, part of her face, inserted into her very skin to keep her quiet as she was violated in unimaginably horrific ways on board an extraterrestrial spacecraft, alongside thousands of other women. Here, G. R. Davies's book goes into a lot of detail regarding Susan's experiences, with her story presented as a straight testimony. In short, she was violated in a quasi-medical manner amidst a sea of gore, human remains and bodily waste stuck on a conveyor belt as part of a herd. Older women would be plucked from above, something attaching to their heads, snatching them away to be disposed of and processed elsewhere on the ship. Younger women, including herself, would have needles and pipes inserted into their bodies so as to be scraped and sucked out. 
and then the fertile ones would be exposed to what she said were half men. The bottom halves of male bodies kept alive by pipes and wires for the purpose of forced procreation. All on a conveyor belt, all in a factory setting, blood and guts and bits of human bodies minced and splattered everywhere around. The offspring from these unions, Susan explained, were taken from birthing mothers as the same bulbous jellyfish creatures she had seen on top of her aunt all those nights before swarmed over them. The babies were then either consumed or given over to faceless black figures she called overseers. She did not know what their purpose was. At the end of Susan's experience, she is said to have woken, still naked, in a field only a short distance from her car. Her clothes were supposedly bundled by its door. When she returned to it, she realized she was on a track road by a woodland. She did not remember driving there. And so she is said to have dressed and driven home, utterly confused, utterly terrified. Undoubtedly, all of this is tremendously difficult to believe. It sounds like the product of an unwell mind, a fever dream, and yet it is alleged to be true. Not only that, Susan, through her interviews with Davies, claims she feels it is her mission, her vital duty, to share her experiences so that so many women around the world can come to understand why they awake each morning with stomach cramps, pains behind their eyes, sickness, diarrhea, strange dreams and visions, and paranoia. And, of course, also to explain why so, so many women, even pregnant women, go missing. Truly noble purposes, and yet ones which, like much else in this story, make little to no sense. After all, if what is reported in this case does actually represent reality, then why not speak out publicly? If there is so much at stake, why hide behind a pseudonym? Especially as, as the end of the book makes clear, Susan has no desire to live or eke out any sort of meaningful human existence in the aftermath of her abductions. Then there are the claims of mass female unexplained illness and disappearances, both of which are presented as solid facts by Susan and the author. And yet, I am uncertain as to how either of these statements are true. Considering the latter, it is difficult to find documentary evidence to support thousands of women being abducted each night, with many never making the journey home after they are either disposed of for being too old or forced to give birth and then be consumed by jellyfish alien beings. For example, in the UK, where this case originates, although there are over 320,000 people reported missing every year, 87% of those are found within two days. Less than 1%, 3,200 people, are missing for longer than a month. And even then, as of March 2022, there are only 5,200 long-term missing individuals in the UK. Now, that is not to diminish these cases at all. Each and every one of those 5,200 people is a tragedy and a heartache for the people who love them. But we must not distort this pain by claiming that there is a constant black hole of missing people that can be explained by the sort of industrial abduction scenario presented by G. Al Davies's book. It is simply unsupportable. Perhaps this condemnation seems harsh, but I would argue that we are duty-bound to attempt to unpick what has been alleged in any and all cases of the extraordinary, to investigate and to challenge, and not just accept. After all, it is necessary to point out a case's flaws in order to protect and preserve the reputation of more compelling, better documented cases of alien encounter and abduction. This is all the more important when a case has been accepted by many as true, as is seen in regards to this one when one consults reviews left on websites including Goodreads and Amazon. For indeed, Susan's story is not an impenetrable narrative. In fact, it is ridiculously flawed. Aside from the obvious issues regarding her identity, the lack of supporting evidence and unsupportable statistics, the long abduction scene comes across as a grotesquely idiotic circus that makes no sense given that the alien beings are described as advanced within the same book. Susan's limb-littered factory is far from the smooth and sterile laboratories usually described by abductees. 
For example, why do her aliens have need of odd biological half-men when they could more efficiently artificially inseminate their human cattle? After all, a rural dairy farmer can easily do so much. Why do these so-called technologically advanced beings seem more backward than the humans they are overlording? Do they merely enjoy the circus? It may be so, but it makes no sense. There are also inconsistencies. For example, how was Susan both mute and sedated and, as is described later in the book, screaming and ultimately able to remember her experiences? In other cases, abductees suffer arduous and traumatic psychiatric and hypnotic regression sessions in order to first uncover and then come to terms with their experiences. In this case, there was none of that. Rather, it very much seems like Susan one day decided to remember and then go off and find someone to have a chat with about it. In addition, it must also be said that this story in many ways reads as some manner of melange of the original 1970s West Wales UFO flap and scenes from popular horror and science fiction movies. We see Lenny the dog barking and terrified of an alien intruder, losing his life similar to how the Coombs family's Labrador Blackie was said to have been driven insane and ultimately euthanized after encountering a similarly featureless spaceman in the window of his family's home in 1977. Then we have scenes that can be said to be comparative to Hollywood films. The face tape over the mouth is reminiscent of Neo in The Matrix and his fight against the antagonist alien-esque agents. Likewise, the red and gory mints of human remains inside the alien craft is similar to the 2005 incarnation of War of the Worlds and the stringy red gore found throughout that film in relation to the alien tripods. We can cite Cloud Atlas and the factory scene there, where women are discarded and processed in a similarly inhumane manner. I am certain the list could continue. Here, it is also interesting to note that, throughout Davies' book on this case, Susan is painted as a sci-fi fan, with Richard Matheson's classic book I Am Legend on her bookcase and Blade Runner cited as one of her favourite movies. During her interview, she even directly references The Matrix. All of this does little to convince the reader of the case's genuineness. With this in mind, the question which we are then duty-bound to ask is whose fantasy is this? Susan's or even the author's himself? After all, without intending to insult G. L. Davis's reputation, it has to be said that given the highly anonymous nature of this story, we are forced to take his word for it that Susan is even a real person, and not just a figment of his imagination. Just like we cannot be certain that the events are real, we cannot be certain Susan is either. It can be said that there are deep and distressing ethical issues regarding presenting a story that is as unsettling as this one as true without providing even a morsel of proof. Given that Davies claims to have seen Susan's personal research, scrapbooks and clippings of UFO and alien abduction cases, would it not have made sense for even a photograph of these to have been included in the book? Of course, maybe there is a good reason for it all, and Susan is real and did need to remain strictly anonymous. And in Davies' defence, in an interview dating to January 2019, in which he discussed this case with Dave Dominguez of the Paranormal Chronicles radio show, he did suggest that he was not necessarily 100% believing of Susan's story. I can't say if their, meaning people like Susan, accounts are real or not, he explained. Only that it's a sad world if this is all true. As for his motivation, there is no shame in pondering, discussing, talking, researching. And here, I must agree, with the caveat that this is only healthy if people fully question the testimonies that they are consuming. Do not mistake me. I dislike having to tear apart a case. I could have gone into more detail about this one, but I shall not. My point has been made. We are obligated to ask questions. I do believe the truth is out there and that it is an unpalatable truth, just not the one presented in this case, and that we will have to fight a lot harder than Susan ever did to find out precisely what it is.
In the 1990s, the small Welsh community of Cleo Aeron had a population of less than 2,000. Occupying the left bank of the River Aeron, the village takes its name from its relation to the waterway, being on one of the Aeron's many magical wooded valley bends. Delightfully rural, a part of the country that is associated with all manner of outdoor pursuits, from fishing to farming, it was in this countryside setting that a young man called Mike resided. In 1991, he lived in a small trailer caravan outside his parents' home, and it was here that he would witness something not merely strange and terrible, but also quite possibly otherworldly as well. My name is Laura and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Late one night in the summer of 1991, Mike, as was his habit, was sitting in his caravan listening to the radio, when, all of a sudden, the sound went static. Clicking followed, and then odd beeps of descending pitch that fell all the way to subsonic, and then rose back up to the higher pitch. After that, the clicks returned, the radio signal of only a moment before thoroughly disrupted. As Mike listened to all of this, it is said that a creeping feeling of nervousness came over him, a sensation that was magnified by the sound of his dog under the porch of the nearby house starting to bark. It was then that Mike heard a low rumbling noise from outside of his caravan a sound which got louder and louder, until, unable to ignore it, he went out to investigate. Sensationally, there was a craft outside. Despite initially thinking it to be an aeroplane, it soon became clear to Mike that whatever he was looking at was not normal. Dark, silhouetted against the night sky, slowly travelling over one of the valley's hills, it appeared to be flying so low that Mike feared it was about to crash. He could see no fuselage, only what looked to be one wing pointing up and another pointing down towards the ground. It was huge, and as slow as it was, seemed to occupy the sky impossibly. Travelling above and over the young man, it moved with what has been described as a thunderous tearing of the air. Mike was certain it was about to fall from the sky. And yet, it didn't. It did, however, trigger, so it seemed, a headache in Mike as it passed over him. Not only that, in the grip of what is claimed to have been an uncomfortable static in the air, the young man fell to the ground, dizzy and unable to control his own motions. Recalling the experience some three decades later, Mike explained that he had a feeling like his head had been momentarily stuck to the ground, like he had been unconscious. The next he could remember, he was crawling back across the field to his caravan, struggling to stand and having difficulty opening the door so as to retreat inside. As the object left, continuing on its way, flying southeast, inland and away from the coast, Mike saw it illuminate. A red light on either side, and then, incredibly, yellow, purple, green and orange lights also, the craft looked to be some manner of arc, or aircraft perpendicular to the ground. Terrified, Mike knew that what he had just witnessed, in combination with the radio interference, his dog's reaction, and above all his body's collapse, had not been an ordinary aircraft. He had seen something incredible. Something otherworldly. In the years afterwards, Mike claims to have experienced further strangeness, including a near-death experience involving a vision of being lifted up into the clouds and communicating with a being inside an invisible plane, and even recurring vivid dreams of being in a setting akin to an operating theatre, where he is repeatedly tortured by having long metal probes inserted behind his eyeballs. In his mind, these experiences are undeniably linked to what he witnessed that summer night in 1991 in Clau Aeron. Whatever one might think of this story, Mike is by no means the only person to have alleged the incredible in the Aeron River Valley. 
According to online archives, on the 23rd of April 2016, a visitor to Abba Aaron, the picturesque seaside town which sits at the mouth of the river, observed a dark disc-shaped object hovering at high altitude over the sea, just beyond the town. The UFO is said to have had a light shining beneath it. Then, earlier in the autumn of 1975, another witness, David Harrison, a bus driver who had just finished work for the day, saw only a stone's throw from Clout Aeron, a cigar-shaped craft over the river valley, heading in the direction of Abba Aeron. Arguably similar to the unidentified object seen by Mike 16 years later, it was, so Harrison testified, moving slowly and had a row of circular lights along its upper half which pulsated blue and yellow. The bus driver is said to have continued watching the craft for around 10 minutes, after which it suddenly shot up at an angle and to the right before disappearing from view. And so, the region surrounding the River Aeron can be said to have a long legacy of otherworldly activity. Someone who knows this better than most is Helena Worth a local woman who, through her lifelong interest in stargazing, can be said to have had more than her fair share of strange experiences. Having lived in the area her whole life, her stories date back to childhood. Recently, after a series of yet more inexplicable things happening in the local area, she made the decision to speak out about her experiences within the Aeron Valley. Happily, I was able to arrange to meet with her and hear some of them firsthand. I've been interested in the sky for very many years. Um, I was born and bred in a very rural location, so our night skies were always very, very dark, no light pollution. And back in those days, when I was young, there was no mobile phones. So a friend of mine called Rebecca, she used to walk up to my house in the evening, and we used to lie down on the road at the front of my house and it was a very quiet road but we used to lie on our backs looking up at the sky for hours and hours so we were really interested in all the constellations and looking at the stars and the moon and often we'd see shooting stars and of course we'd see um, satellites going by um, satellites just have a straight line trajectory and um, they don't change their course and we knew that but from time to time we would see something unusual and we got to know what is unusual and what is normal because we spent so many hours doing it. Given how many hours Helena and her friends spent staring up at the night sky, she soon came to recognise what was usual and what wasn't. Directional changes were, for example, one of the characteristics that a young Helena identified as peculiar. We thought it was a satellite and then it would change its course. It would move in the opposite direction, for example, and we saw that from time to time. Her interest in the night sky having expanded, Helena continued to stargaze into adulthood, until one day she saw something utterly unexpected. It was the 11th of December 2018, and it was very cold, and it was a very dark morning. I got up at six o'clock in the morning to let the puppies out, and I opened the back door, bearing in mind the weather was very cold but dry and it was pitch black being six o'clock in the morning in December. I opened the back door and I have a view of the Aeron Valley, so we live at the bottom of the Aeron Valley, so we can see the other side of the Aeron Valley and there are houses dotted all along. And what caught my view as soon as I opened the back door was a ball of what I thought a massive ball of fire and even though it was pitch black I knew the location of it I thought gosh that's over by the houses over there and my initial reaction was oh my goodness there's a house on fire across the valley and the ball of fire was the size of a house and I stood there contemplating what am I going to do do I call the fire brigade and say there's a house on fire, or shall I drive over there and see which house it is and then call the fire brigade? And as I was deciding what to do, this ball of fire started to move, and I knew straight away that isn't a house on fire. It was spherical, 
perfectly round, the size of a house. It was bright, bright white to yellow. And it started moving above, I believe above the houses and above the trees. Because I couldn't see the houses, of course. I could only see this flame. It started moving to the west in a straight line. Quite slowly, I would say from here, maybe between 20 to 30 miles an hour. And then it stopped and hovered over what I believe would have been a house over there. It hovered and it stayed there. And it wasn't just a ball of fire. It was, it was undulating. It was, the perimeter of it was doing this. It wasn't just static. It was, it was as if it was alive somehow. It was undulating like this. And it hovered over the house for, I would say, a minute. And then it started going back towards the east and it continued to fly over houses, over trees, sometimes behind trees. And as it was flying, this, what I can only describe as molten lava was dripping from underneath it. Drip, 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 drip. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it continued to drip and fly over trees, over trees, and I could see it going along the Aran Valley. And just before it went out of sight, the top half of the sphere turned a bright, bright red colour. Really, really bright, bright red light. And then it went out of view. I was absolutely stunned and I could not take my eyes off it. I was stood in awe watching it. I didn't even think to take a phone out of my pocket. I didn't have a phone in my pocket, but I didn't even think to grow, go and grab my phone. All I wanted to do was watch this thing. I wanted to take it all in and I, because I knew it was something so highly unusual. Despite attempting to rationalise what she witnessed, including researching ball lightning and other natural phenomena, Helena was left profoundly changed by her sighting. No longer merely interested in the stars in the sky, she soon after turned her attention to other celestial objects as well, most especially those of an unusual and unidentifiable nature. Over four years later, she is now convinced that what she saw that December morning was extraterrestrial in some way. After seeing that, it confirmed 100% my belief in extraterrestrials. I am sure it was an extraterrestrial craft of some sort, or these orbs, like a massive orb it was, these orbs could be living beings in themselves. Such a sensational conclusion is not one that Helena has come to lightly. During our interview, she demonstrated extensive knowledge of other UFO sightings across the world, information which she has taken it upon herself to cultivate in the years since her 2018 sighting. And yet, her belief that these orb-like objects may very well be alive is not something that she has decided through continuing research alone. For, after witnessing the large, molten, dripping fire orb, she claims to have had other encounters with other seemingly living orbs, even as recently as just a few weeks before our meeting. One evening, just a few weeks ago, I went out to the front, opened the door and stood up and started looking and immediately saw a ping-pong sized orb, very, very bright, light blue light, very bright. And it was up just a few meters ahead of me, but up high, as high as the oak tree that's at the front. And it was there hovering. And obviously I was watching it. And then it started floating down a little bit like a feather, like this, very slowly, just right in front of me from the height of the tree all the way down, very slowly, bright, bright orb. And before it hit the wall, which is just the opposite side of the road, it just blinked out into nothing. Given that Helena's home overlooks a deer park, a large expanse of wilderness and ancient woodland in which there are no houses or other man-made light sources, this was undoubtedly strange. 
by this point well practiced in examining her experiences and other claims of unidentified flying objects, she also confirmed that there were no lightning storms or other weather phenomena which might offer an explanation as to the floating blue light orb. Discussing her other experiences in more detail, she also revealed to me that she had captured a similar orb on her home security system. This is an image from my doorbell cam and I've just taken a screenshot of it. Here's a car with its backlight and front light. Here's my car and in the forest at the back of the deer park there's an orb there. Now I didn't physically see this orb with my own eyes, it's just that the doorbell cam happened to take this picture as there was movement in front of the camera. So because the car was here arriving, yeah. it took a picture. And so these were not just imagined sightings, but actual light anomalies that could be captured on camera and indeed seen by others. Me and my son viewed an orb together. Um, and this was only about three or four months ago. Again, I went out to the front, as I normally do before I go to bed, and he followed me out, looking up, the, up at the stars before I go to bed. And I pointed up and I said, look at that, Eddie, I said. There's a really bright um, satellite going along there. Watch it, it's really, really bright. And it was slightly bigger than the other stars, because usually a satellite would be about the size of the other stars. But it was slightly bigger, same colour, orangey colour. Same brightness. I said, look, look at that satellite. It's really, really bright. Watch it. Let's watch it together. And we were watching it together and it was doing its usual straight line trajectory. And then it stopped. And it stopped and it just stayed there. And me and my son looked at each other and he knows I'm into, you know, UFO watching, UAP watching, sky watching. And he says, mum, it stopped. And I said, yeah, Eddie, I think we're looking at a UFO. And literally, I stood out there for an hour watching this thing, waiting for it to move, because I thought, what's it going to do next? Will it zoom off? And I wanted to watch. And I watched for about an hour, and it, I was so cold by that point, I'd given up and I went indoors. But that was highly unusual. And yeah, my son was a witness to that. And yet, as awe-inspiring as some of Helena's experiences have been, she has also been left scared. Horrifyingly, she told me about a time that two of these light orbs entered her home. This was about a year ago now, probably in 2022, and in the middle of the night, as I usually do, I get up out of bed to use the bathroom, so I walked past the front door. Now the front door is one of these doors where the top half is glass, but it's like this bathroom glass, so it's got patterns in it. And then the bottom half of the door is just plastic. So as I walked past the door, the porch door, there were two blue lights in the porch. And I stood there and looked at them. One of the lights was a light blue color the other light next to it was a slightly darker blue, but both of which were bright lights. They weren't circular. It was as if there was a something standing there, but this something that was standing there was just a pure blue light. But what was funny to me was, I looked at it, acknowledged it was there, and carried on doing my thing, went to the bathroom, walked back, and as I was walking back to the bedroom, I walked past the door again and they were still there. I went to bed, I closed my eyes and I went to sleep. My reaction in the morning was, why on earth did I ignore those things? Why did I just go back to bed and go back to sleep? Why didn't I wake up my husband and say, look, there are blue beings in the porch. My reaction to it, I felt, was very highly unusual. I know I saw those things. I walked past it twice and they were there both times. I wasn't sleepwalking. I was very aware of where I was and what I was doing. Does it concern you that they were, these lights were inside your house? Yes, I would say yes. 
I feel very privileged that they were there. But at the same time, after that, I didn't sleep very well for a few nights, for a few weeks, really. I was, I was, I, it did frighten me a little bit after the experience, but the experience itself at that time, I wasn't frightened. But after that, from the next day, following day onwards, then I, I was a little unnerved about it. And certainly, in the course of our conversation, Helena revealed other unsettling details about her experiences. Electrical anomalies inside her home, further light orbs, and even as a girl an experience which, as she explained it, gave me chills. When I was very young, and I can only guess I might have been five years old, and I've always remembered this, but in the back of my mind tried to forget it, because it was quite scary. And one night I woke up in my bedroom and in my bedroom I had two single beds, one this side of the room and one that side of the room so that if I had girlfriends come over to sleep over, they'd have a bed to sleep on, in. So I was asleep in this, this bed and I woke up in the middle of the night and all I remember was sitting up in bed, grabbing my quilt holding it in front of my face like this, staring at something that was at the end of the bed. And there was something there that absolutely terrified me. And I was screaming, but no sound was coming out of my mouth. And I cannot for the life of me remember what I was screaming at, but what it was, it absolutely terrified me. And after that, I don't know, I must have gone back to sleep, but I'm not sure. And the next morning, when I woke up, I was in that bed. Hmm. And that frightens me. That actually frightens me. Just talking about it. I got, I got chills when you yeah. we were saying yeah. it. So again, you told me that because you knew we were going to be talking about this sort of thing. So why again did your mind link that experience mm. to the things that you've seen in the sky? Well, when I was little, I didn't link that experience to anything really. I just thought of it as a really frightening experience that I wanted to forget. But only really since having my major sighting in 2018 did I start thinking back to that time and remembering what happened. And possibly, I don't know, possibly there's a link between the two. I can't say 100% that what I was looking at was an extraterrestrial. But I tell you what, there's a real possibility, you know, what was I screaming at? And whatever it was, I've either, it was so terrifying that I've blanked it out of my brain completely, of my own accord, or whatever it was, did it blank my memory for me in order to save me from terror? I don't know. Whilst Helena throughout her interview was always clear to express a sense of awe and being honoured for having been given the chance to witness all that she has, such stories undeniably cast an eerie shadow on her experiences. What is more, it is difficult to forget that others in the Aran Valley, including Mike in 1991, have also been left overwhelmed by their possibly extraterrestrial encounters. Recently, the valley and the wider area have been experiencing somewhat of a panic in terms of a series of shocking animal deaths. Indeed, it was an article published by the Cambrian News, a weekly regional newspaper, which encouraged Helena to speak out about extraterrestrial activity on Earth. It was reported that, according to local farmers and rural property owners, a big cat was on the loose, killing and horrifically mutilating livestock. A series of photographs and testimonies were published. In one case, two sheep were shown to have been expertly skinned. According to local farmer Jonathan Davies, no native animal was capable of such precise butchering and so concerned, he contacted the police. Later speaking to the Cambrian News, he revealed that he was told informally that a big cat could have been responsible for the killings. Elusive big cats, including black panthers, have a long legacy right across the United Kingdom. 
Although not proven to exist in the wilds of Britain, in Wales in particular, the Beast of Bont was said to have haunted the county of Ceredigion throughout the 1980s and 90s, being blamed for the deaths of at least 50 sheep. Located in the same county as the Arran Valley, a meagre 50 miles as the crow flies from Helena's home, in the spring of 2023 there were fears that the predator, or indeed one of its descendants, had returned. And yet, with no cat captured and bodies still piling, some, including Helena, have started to look elsewhere for explanations. For her, it was no coincidence that sheep, skinned and laid out like rugs, were turning up dead in an area associated with UFO activity. In particular, she thinks that the light orbs that she has seen hold the key to understanding animal mutilations. Fascinatingly, Helena is by no means alone in holding such beliefs. According to Phil Hoyle and his non-profit organisation, the Animal Pathology Field Unit, in recent decades there have been many reports of unusual animal deaths in Wales and the bordering English county of Shropshire, most especially in conjunction with sightings of orbs and spheres of light. After identifying a 50-mile UFO red zone crossing from England into Wales, Hoyle and his team were allegedly able to observe a bright burnt red light hanging over an isolated ravine near a highly forested area known as New Radnor. This was in 2001, at a time when the same area had experienced a high number of sheep deaths, with the bodies that were found having had their flesh carefully stripped away their brains and other internal organs clinically removed, and their eyes taken. Some of the animals were even found with neat holes on their bodies. During his team's investigation, the red light is said to have disappeared into a valley, reappearing in the blink of an eye elsewhere. Other lights were also observed, with some being said to have changed shape and emit beams of light morphing and odd, darting, so it was reported, backwards and forwards across the valley floor, as though they were looking for something. The next day, so Hoyle explained in an article, I interviewed farmers in the valley. All but one farm had unusual disappearances of animals or deaths with strange injuries. In many ways, the sheep that have been discovered in the Aran Valley in recent months can be said to share characteristics with those investigated by Hoyle and his team in the early 2000s. And yet, examining these instances is less than straightforward, especially as there is such a wide range of testimony. Some who have come forward speak of the unnaturally clean and clinical nature of the kills. Others have described in horrific detail how their livestock have been utterly and savagely eviscerated. One speaks of precise, almost medical-like intelligent intervention, the other of a vicious wild predator. Whilst investigating possible extraterrestrial activity in the Aran Valley and the wider region of West Wales, I was able to obtain footage of one such mutilated lamb be much more in line with the clean and clinical than some of the more brutal descriptions, it was discovered in a field at the end of April. Abandoned in the middle of the pasture, with the other sheep and indeed scavengers including ravens keeping their distance from it, it can be said to very much match the descriptions provided by researchers like Phil Hoyle. Given its graphic nature, I have decided to blur the footage. For those who are interested, uncensored images will be available on my website. Either way, the lamb appeared drained of blood, with there being no sign of a frenzy, either on the ground around it or on its pristine white wool. Its innards were likewise spotless, with all of its organs and genitalia gone. It also appeared to have had its ear removed. Intrigued, I was able to set up a trail camera overlooking the location of the killing. The only predator I was able to film was a fox. Surely this was not our culprit. And so, wanting to understand better what I was looking at, and indeed ascertain whether or not the remains were so unusual that they might be considered extraterrestrial, I contacted Richard Freeman, cryptozoological author and zoological director at the Centre for Fortean Zoology. After sending him the image, he was certain as to the identity 
of the killer. The characteristics of a big cat kill, you seem quite convinced that the photo I shared with you is a big cat kill. It looks like a typical big cat kill to me. Uh, I examined one in North Devon a few years ago, and it was a, a full-grown sheep, not a lamb, and it had had its neck dislocated by being bitten in the neck, which is a typical cat attack. They'll attack by dislocation of the neck bones or suffocation by putting their mouth over the, the mouth of the prey item or strangulation by biting a trachea. Then the fleece was sort of peeled away, almost like you would peel the skin of a banana or a kipper. And then the bones picked clean and the internal organ has gone. Cut totally stripped of meat, very neatly, and the bones weren't crunched up. A dog kill is totally different. Dogs will bite at the flank and the sides of a sheep, hamstringing it, pulling it down, so they'll rip out pieces of the fleece and they'll be all over the all over the place. A big cat has um, a tongue rather like sandpaper with little tiny little um, spikes on it, and when they lick the, a bone, they'll rasp the flesh off it. They'll very rarely crunch bones up. So it looked very clean. It looked too clean to be a dog kill. Because I, I know people who are more in the animal mutilation from an extraterrestrial side of things would say that because there's no blood and because there's no blood on the ground around it, that that means there's something eerie about it. But animals, cats in particular, can do this. Animals will lick up blood. Those scavengers will clean it up. Yes, and nature does quite a remarkable job of cleaning everything up then, and it might seem strange yeah. to us looking on, but there can be a natural explanation. Yeah, well that, that lamb to me looked like it was taken by a big cat. And what do you think about big cats in the UK? Because obviously we're talking about something that we don't expect to see here. We've had reports of big cats in the UK for years and years and years and years. Um, a lynx was shot in Devon in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, we've had um, a female puma was caught in 1980 by a farmer. Well, that's really interesting, and it is almost solving one bizarre element with, in a way, another bizarre element that there are these cats and there must be a breeding population and they just live there for the most part, minding their own business. Now, I know there are some more perhaps wild uh, beliefs uh, that you come across in Fortean circles. For example, that they are big cats, but they're still somehow alien big cats. So a bit of a, a fun question for you then. What's your opinion on the idea of an alien oh. big cat? Oh, no, I don't think they are. Um, because they behave like ordinary animals. They kill and eat like ordinary animals. They leave footprints and hair behind them like ordinary animals. They leave scats like ordinary animals. And so, from a zoological perspective, there is no doubt that the lamb in question was killed by a flesh and blood feline. All of this is not to say that alien animal mutilations aren't happening, only that, on this occasion at least, this isn't it. In the United Kingdom, the official narrative is that there are no big cats in the wild. And yet, as my footage and the testimonies of countless others show, it is no difficult task to prove the inverse. And so, while such does not necessarily help in confirming extraterrestrial activity on Earth, it should tell you that official narratives are not always correct, and that we shouldn't, as a society, be so quick to dismiss the testimonies of people like Helena Worth, simply because our governments tell us that the things that they claim aren't real. Reality is rarely ever so black and white. It is instead a rich mosaic comprising each of our individual shades of grey. And this is what makes Helena's story so intriguing. Not only is she a compelling witness, able to express herself both concisely and in a detail-rich manner, she is also not necessarily saying anything that hasn't already been said. Her shades of grey are similar to those put forward by others. In particular, the suggested link between extraterrestrials and orbs of light can be said to be worthy of further investigation. 
After all, in addition to Phil Hoyle and the red light orbs he and his team witnessed in the same area, and on the same night as multiple livestock disappearances and mutilations in 2001, there are stories from the United States as well. For example, in 1967 in Colorado's San Luis Valley, a horse named Lady was discovered horrifically stripped of flesh after residents reported seeing odd lights moving low and rapidly over the desert. Leading UFO researcher Timothy Good has, in several of his books, highlighted the presence of such light orbs in suspected mutilation cases, with him describing orange, silent, glowing objects on several occasions. Here, it is also worth noting that similar light orbs have been seen over and around crop circles, once more offering the possibility that non-human intelligent light anomalies have the ability to modify physical targets, whether that be sheep, horses, or wheat. And yet, for all of this, the question of motive is still a difficult one to answer. I wonder why these orbs are doing it. Surely it's either for research? Um, are they researching the bodies of biological beings that live on Earth? Or are they doing it for their own sustenance? Do they need to be using the flesh to eat? I, maybe not, but it's a possibility, who knows? The whole UFO thing makes no sense whatsoever when looked at as literal aliens coming to Earth. Why would an intelligent species that. Of course, whilst determining motive is undoubtedly important, it also must be said that, given the alien nature of the problem, it may simply be impossible for us to comprehend the actions of an extraterrestrial species, most especially one which may have evolved in a world and under conditions very different from our own. Intelligence, even on Earth, takes many forms and so who is to say what alien intelligence might look like? In regards to Helena's own experiences within the Erin Valley, most especially her major encounter with the Molten Fire Orb in 2018, I wanted to know her opinion as to why she seems to have been selected to see all that she has seen. Because it started dripping this molten lava, and before it went out of view, the top half of it turned red, I'm wondering why did it do that? Had it seen me? Was it communicating with me? I've no idea. I think round here is a hot spot for orb activity. That is for sure. There's definitely a lot of orb activity around this area in the Aaron Valley. But part of my mind is also wondering, do they know I'm watching? Are they saying hello in their own little way? by showing themselves. So I really do wonder, and I'm not really sure. I'd like to think they're communicating with me in some way. And so, even beyond her personal connection to extraterrestrial happenings, Helena has expressed that she believes the Aeron Valley to be a hotspot. One of the reasons why she believes this is to do with its topography, namely that it is a valley. Certainly, even just now, I referenced an infamous animal mutilation case which took place in San Luis Valley. This valley, the same as the Aaron Valley, and numerous others around the world, is synonymous with UFO sightings. According to Helena, this may have something to do with extraterrestrials wanting to hide themselves from radar. As the crow flies south from here, I would guess between 8 and 10 miles, is the Aberporth military um, airport, and they train military personnel there. So they will have some sort of radar in place there. Their radar surely would come this far, but if these UAPs and, and orbs are in the valley, flying along these valleys, they're not going to see them. And so because we live at the bottom of the valley, I believe I'm seeing more orbs because of that. And so, Helena is very much of the opinion that these orbs, whatever they may be, are reluctant to be seen by the military. In the UK and in the USA and elsewhere, these things have been shot down, and these UAPs know this. They don't want to be seen by military. Um, the military have always had an aggressive reaction to seeing these things. 
so I don't blame them for hiding. That Helena mentions Aberporth and the potential danger that the military installation there may pose such extraterrestrial orbs is especially interesting. After all, according to an article published in a 1974 edition of the much-loved UFO journal Flying Saucer Review, radar anomalies were commonplace at the time. Indeed, the article's author, F. W. Holliday, described how he used to know the Lieutenant Colonel in charge of the Aberporth rocket pads. According to him, puzzling objects had been detected by his radar scanners at various times. On one occasion, so the same article reveals, something akin to a soundless missile was spotted by a separate witness over a populated area within range of the site's radar. Could it be that in the decades since, such UFOs and light anomalies have learnt to avoid detection by the radar, and now travel along valleys, such as the one home to the River Aron? It is an equally peculiar and unsettling thought, most especially as, on my journey from extraterrestrial light orbs to elusive big cats and back again to the orbs, I cannot help but return to Helena's nighttime encounters both as a child waking up in a different bed, and more recently, seeing the two blue light entities in her home. What was the reason for it, and more importantly, why did these beings, whatever they may be, feel the need to conceal themselves in our valleys? Fear of the military may be one thing, but nighttime violation of our private spaces, our homes, our beds is another. Why are they here? What do they want? These may be questions that we are never able to answer. Oh, here, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. It was the early hours of the 26th of December 1980, and a 20-year-old John Burroughs was in a police cruiser. A USAF airman, he had been stationed at the twin bases of Bentwaters and Woodbridge since July the previous year. Located in Suffolk, England, the two Royal Air Force bases were being leased by the British Ministry of Defence to the American Air Force, so as to provide a crucial rear ward maintenance centre for troops on the front line in Germany. This was the Cold War, and anything could happen. It was for that reason that Burroughs and his watch supervisor, Bud Parker, were driving inside the perimeter fence at Woodbridge, close to the east gate where the runway ends and the thick pines of Rendlesham Forest began. Members of the law enforcement branch of the Air Force, it was their job to perform patrols and ensure the safety of the base. It was therefore of importance when the men noticed something strange in the trees beyond the base lights, but not emitted by anything normal as far as the two airmen were concerned. And so, getting out of their vehicle so as to open the gate which marked the edge of USAF jurisdiction, Burroughs and Parker drove along a forestry commission track into the trees. I was scared, Burroughs revealed many years later. He had what he described as a very weird feeling. There was something unusual about the lights he and his supervisor were seeing. There was, at first, just one, a big, low light in the sky which appeared to fall into the forest. As it did, it changed, appearing as a mass of multicoloured glowing lights, largely blue and red. There was also a white glow, which is said to have increased in brightness as Burroughs stood on the edge of the forest. Unsure as to what they were looking at, Burroughs and Parker decided to return to the gatehouse and report the incident to the law enforcement desk sergeant. They were told to stay where they were, and await the arrival of a security patrol. What would follow in the opening hours of Boxing Day 1980 would forever be remembered as the best documented UFO encounter to have occurred in Britain, Europe, and quite possibly even the world. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Sergeant Jim Penniston was the Central Security Control Officer sent to attend the incident at RAF Woodbridge's East Gate. Upon arrival, he was directed towards Rendlesham Forest by Burroughs and Parker. There, he observed multiple coloured lights on the edge of the forest inside the trees. 
believing it to be a fire, the sort of thing you might get from chemicals burning after an air crash, he asked the two airmen if they saw the plane go down. Their response confused the seasoned sergeant. There had been no crash, it had simply landed. At this, Peniston knew he would have to go into the trees so as to investigate. And so, once clearance was given by central security control for the sergeant to leave the base, he and Burroughs checked in their weapons and entered the forest. They only had to drive a hundred yards or so past the gate for their radio contact with the base to break. Eerie and unusual, the lights in the trees were still plainly visible, and so the men continued deeper into the woods, Peniston certain that they were about to encounter a crash site. That, however, was not at all what they found. Rather, according to the two men's testimonies, shared many years after the initial incident, in Peniston's case a whole 14, what they stumbled across in Rendlesham Forest at 2.30am on the 26th of December 1980 was categorically not an air crash. On the ground, some 30 feet in front of them, was a craft. The size of a tank, triangular and very smooth with no sharp edges, and a surface that resembled semi-transparent black glass, it made absolutely no sound. It was, however, illuminated by light that somehow appeared to emerge from the background of the object. Said to have been a very brilliant white light with multicolored lights inside, such meant that the entire forest appeared aglow. So startled by the sight were Burroughs and Peniston that they immediately threw themselves to the forest floor. Utterly terrified, with faces to the dirt, the two military men went on to allege that the object secreted some manner of strange energy, almost as if time and space were being distorted within its vicinity. It felt almost like static electricity, Burroughs has reported. I had never felt a sensation quite like that before. I do not really know how to phrase this, but it was as if I was moving in slow motion. Uncertain as to whether or not he still had control over his body, the airman could only remain on the ground. Peniston independently described a similar sensation of bizarre otherworldliness, expressing how there was a sense of slowness, like time itself was an effort. And so it was that Burroughs and Peniston fought to regain composure. The former believes they spent only a couple of minutes observing the strangeness, the latter no more than twenty. And yet, by the time the craft flew off, climbing skyward into a blur, and the men returned to the gatehouse, a whole hour had passed. Burroughs and Peniston could not explain what they had seen, were reluctant even to speak of it, and yet the base's radar had also tracked an unidentified object at around 2am. Not only that, the airmen were later officially advised that British forces knew of no aircraft that should have been above Rendlesham Forest that morning. And so, the lights and strange black glass triangle in the forest were a mystery. Following procedure, British police were immediately informed, with a patrol arriving shortly after 4am. One of the officers sent to the site, however, seemed to be more concerned with rabbits than anything else, dismissing what Burroughs told him and the three physical impressions left on the forest floor by the object that they had seen as the burrows of the forest-dwelling animals. Perhaps Burroughs and his colleague had simply confused the lighthouse for the strange lights that they had allegedly seen in the forest, the police officer suggested. Orford Ness Lighthouse was, after all, only five miles away, and it was easy for foreigners, even military men such as Burroughs, to get disoriented in the dark. Rabbits and lighthouses. Strangely, the very same explanations would be rehashed and repeated again and again by pound shop skeptics in the media for years to come as would the claim, propagated by the ordinarily reputable New Scientist magazine, that the airmen had simply seen the lights of the police patrol car through the trees. The same police patrol car that had been called out an hour afterwards in response to the event that is allegedly being debunked. And so, a time-travelling vehicle instead of a mysterious black triangle. Logic perfected. Such gives an immediate sense of the layers of denial and truly desperation associated with this case. Indeed, the events of December 1980, or as they are now collectively known, the Rendlesham Forest Incident, represent a cover-up of massive proportions. 
or as the prominent UFO researcher and author Jenny Randalls has put it, the ultimate game of information, disinformation, misinformation. For certain, Lee Rendlesham is, in many ways, the British equivalent of Roswell, a tremendously well-documented episode in the annals of the inexplicable, comprising military documents, concealed or otherwise, the now infamous live tape recording of events by a senior USAF colonel, radar data, and over 50 civilian and military witnesses. It also spanned three days, resulting in a complex sequence of events often poorly explained. A narrative confused by the vast amount of drama that unfolded in a relatively short space of time. For truly, there can be said to have been two major incidents that took place that Christmas in Rendlesham, with the second of the two being the one most often referenced. Despite his vast amount of experience in the US Air Force, Colonel Charles Holt is undoubtedly best known for being the man who saw objects extraterrestrial in origin in Rendlesham Forest in December 1980. These are, after all, his own words, issued in June 2010 as a notarized affidavit. In this, Colonel Holt not merely summarized the alleged events of the Rendlesham incident, but also accused the security services of both the United States and the United Kingdom of having attempted, both then and now, to subvert the significance of what occurred at Rendlesham Forest and RAF Bentwaters by the use of well-practiced methods of disinformation. Again, a cover-up of massive proportions. And rather than merely be referring to the black glass triangle observed in the early hours of the 26, Holt was also directly referencing his own experience in the same patch of British forest less than 48 hours later, when he, as deputy base commander, was forced to abandon the base's Christmas party to investigate what was reported to be at the time the return of the mysterious object first seen by Burroughs and Penniston. Assembling a team of four others to take with him, by the time Colonel Holt entered Rendlesham Forest, it was just after midnight, and thus the small hours of Sunday the 28th of December. Armed with cameras, Geiger counters, and a tape recorder, the airmen left their vehicles and set off on foot. According to the live tape recording made by Holt that day, at around 150 feet or more from the initial suspected impact point, they experienced difficulty with the large, gas-powered searchlights they had brought with them. There seemed to be some kind of mechanical problem, a problem which would persist all night, resulting in only one of about half a dozen lights to work, albeit with intermittent problems of its own. The men also experienced issues with their radios. Regardless, they moved deeper into the trees. When Holt and his men eventually arrived at the suspected landing site, they experienced an uptick on their Geiger counters. The readings were unexpectedly high and seemed to correlate with their proximity to the so-called pod marks that were still visible on the forest floor from two days prior, being described at the time as residual readings. Listening to Colonel Holt's tape recording, which he made throughout their investigation, one can hear the panic in the men's voices as the reading continued to climb. Looks like an area here, possibly. It could be a blast. It's in the center. It's hard to tell. We've got to take us one thing about the three. Here it is. Up to what? Seven. What? Just jump it up to what? Seven tenths here. Seven tenths right here in the center? Uh huh. And such a sense of panic and excitement can be said to have sustained, and indeed magnified, as the investigation in the woods continued. The marks on the ground were examined further, with measurements and even photographs now declassified being taken by USAF personnel. Additionally, in Colonel Holt's tape recording, we hear from one of the men how it looked like something twisted as it sat down on them. Looks like someone took something and sat it down and twisted it from side to side. Mm -hmm. Very strange. According to Holt's later written memo, these three depressions measured one and a half inches deep and seven inches in diameter. As for the radiation readings, beta gamma readings of 0.1 milliroentgens were recorded with peak readings in the three depressions and near the center of the triangle formed by the depressions. A nearby tree also had moderate readings on the side of the tree towards the same depressions. In the tape recording, we also hear how, by using the infrared beam of a star light scope, the tree was revealed to have a white streak on it, which indicated a heat source. Welcome to 
about the same tree we took the sample off with this, what do you call it, star scope? Uh -huh, star yeah, yeah. Getting a definite heat reflection off the tree, about, about three to four feet off the ground. Presumably, these anomalous readings were residuals from the events that took place on the 26th. As Colonel Holt's investigation continued, he and his men moved further into the forest. Ultimately, and sensationally, they found themselves in pursuit of something indisputably odd. What would later be described in Holt's written report as a red sun-like light. Said to have moved about and pulsed erratically, at one point the light appeared to throw off glowing particles, after which it somewhat shockingly broke into five separate white objects, and then disappeared in the sky. The encounter not yet over, a further three so-called strange lights in the sky were observed, objects said to have displayed red, green and blue lights. At first elliptical, they supposedly turned to full circles. Then, sometime after that, arguably the most sensational moment of the night occurred. The beaming down of a stream of white light. Oh, here, here he comes from the south, he's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Throughout, animals, both wild in the forest and domesticated on nearby farmland, were said to have been very, very active and making an awful lot of noise. When the men finally returned to base, they were exhausted and utterly dumbfounded. Undoubtedly, given his continuing support for something unusual, possibly even extraterrestrial, having happened that night, Colonel Holt was left profoundly affected by his Rendlesham Forest experience. In the new year, on the 13th of January 1981, he submitted a brief written report to the UK Ministry of Defence, famously titled Unexplained Lights, expecting to be summoned so as to answer questions and provide further information. The call from a superior, however, never came, with the incident being largely hushed up and forgotten. For certainly, halt aside, many of the airmen who witnessed something strange in Rendlesham Forest over the course of those few nights soon found themselves relocated to other military installations. Scared to talk about what they had seen, they continued their work in silence, with little information reaching the public in those first few weeks. After all, Holt's memo, now infamous in UFO circles, was kept a secret and out of public hands for a full two years until 1983, when the Freedom of Information Act forced the hand of the US government. The year afterwards, a copy of his tape was also released, this time not officially, but rather as a leak sent out to UFO researchers by a military insider. And yet, for all of the military hush-hush, it had, for those on the ground and in the area, been immediately clear that something strange had indeed taken place from the night of the 25th through to the early hours of the 28th of December. After all, USAF servicemen were not the only ones to have seen things. That we have such abundant civilian testimony in this case is thanks to the work of local researchers Brenda Butler and Dot Street, who worked with UFO author Jenny Randalls to put together the first comprehensive book on the Rendlesham Forest incident, Sky Crash, A Cosmic Conspiracy. Said to have trawled pubs and other social venues in the area, Butler and Street took it upon themselves to find any and every person who had something to say about the strange sights in the sky that Christmas. One such witness was Jerry Harris. The owner of a small garage near Woodbridge, it was early Boxing Day morning, and thus the day of the first incident, when he and his wife spotted a blinding light above Rendlesham Forest. Similar is the account of the Webb family, who were driving home late on the road close to the forest at around 2.30am, when they allegedly spotted what they first thought was a star following them. The sight was so strange that they stopped at the first opportunity. 
and so it was, from a roadside lay-by, that they observed a huge glow illuminating Rendlesham Forest, very much similar to that described by Airmen Burroughs and Penniston. Father, Roy Webb's testimony is recorded in one of Jenny Randall's books on the incident. It was hovering, and close by, and completely silent. It accelerated from a standing start, and shot across the sky. It disappeared in a couple of seconds. Undoubtedly, this is very similar to military testimony. There were even strange sightings across the county border into Norfolk, where a food production manager called Tony Sorrell alleged to have seen a triangle-shaped object moving along in the sky as he returned from his house after locking the shed door. This was late on Saturday the 27th, and thus would have directly coincided with reports made on the RAF base of the return of the unidentified flying object, the same reports which ultimately sent Colonel Holt and his team of men into the forest. Perhaps the most shocking of all, however, comes from Gordon Levitt, whose rural home was situated on the edge of Rendlesham Forest. It was late, and he was putting his dog outside into its kennel, when both he and the animal were inexplicably drawn towards the night sky. There was an object, eerie and glowing, in the heavens above them. This UFO is said to have descended, and flew in the direction of Levitt and his dog. Supposedly, it hovered for a few seconds over his garden, at twice the height of the rooftops, before speeding away and disappearing over the woods in the direction of RAF Woodbridge. The next day, Levitt's dog is said to have shown signs of illness and distress, refusing, contrary to its usually fierce nature, to leave its kennel. A week or so later, the animal tragically died, with a vet suggesting that it seemed to have succumbed to some sort of poisoning. And so, truly, something odd seems to have taken place those few nights. Not only that, there are rumours and reports of hard evidence radar data confirming that something strange was active in the sky that December, including the testimony of air traffic controller Malcolm Scurra. One such anomaly, so Scurra claimed, was so fast and unusual, achieving an altitude of 90,000 feet in five minutes, that it was unable to be intercepted by the two RAF phantoms that were scrambled in pursuit. In addition to suspected military data, there exist claims from Civil Aviation Authority operators. It has even been reported that a passenger jet witnessed a brilliant explosion mid-air, in the sky towards Felixstowe, a town situated on the coast a mere ten miles from the alleged Rendlesham landing site. Intriguingly, there are also reports from the British Astronomical Association of unusually high levels of space activity on the night of the 25th only a few hours before Burrow and Penniston's Black Triangle forest encounter. But before we lose ourselves, it must be stated that, as incredible as much of this seems to be, undoubtedly some of what was seen those nights over Rendlesham Forest and the surrounding area will be able to be explained away in terms of comets and space junk. For indeed, at least one known object, the burn-up of a Soviet satellite, Cosmos 749, was known to have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at just past 9pm on Christmas evening. Such may account for some of the bright lights and explosions sighted. And yet, even considering this, it would be disingenuous to blame all sightings from this period on space junk and fireballs, most especially when considered alongside everything else that has been claimed. For, as strange, shocking, and sensational as the testimonies of Colonel Charles Holt, Sergeant Jim Penniston, and John Burroughs are, there are other, even more incredible testimonies to be found in regards to the Rendlesham Forest incident. Arguably most famous are the claims made by the then 19-year-old USAF security policeman, Larry Warren. On his first tour of duty at RAF Bentwaters when the incident occurred, he came forward in early 1983 to speak of what happened, making him the first military witness to do so. And, whilst much of what he has said does match the testimonies of others, for example, Colonel Holt and the men's struggle with the gas fueled searchlights, there is also much that goes far beyond anything that is generally claimed to have happened between the 25th and the 28th of December. In short, we are talking about the presence of alien beings, something which other witnesses, including Charles Holt and John Burroughs, have explicitly denied. Even so, according to Larry Warren, they were there that night. 
Not only that, he claims to have observed senior USAF airmen interact with three non-human life forms. Discussing that night in various interviews, Warren has explained how he was part of a five-man group told to move off into the forest at around 11.30 pm. Claiming to have been an airman first class with a secret clearance, Warren states that the first thing he saw was a giant, yellowish-green translucent object on the ground. Fifty feet across and a foot in height, it was, so Warren claims, like a platform attached to the ground rather than hovering. Beyond this object, he could see a farmer's house with a light on and a car in the driveway. According to Warren, there was no heat and no sound, and time seemed to be at half speed. Some men ran off in fear. He, in utter shock, remained. He claims that what happened next matches up with part of what Holt and his team, separate from Warren's, observed through the trees from a distance of around 200 yards. Specifically, the red blinking light was that which Larry Warren encountered. It supposedly came from around the back of the translucent object. Inside the light were three small beings, or, in Warren's words, what you'd only describe as children. Around four to four and a half feet tall, they were supposedly very bright and translucent at points. Their faces, however, were said to have been very clear, and very clearly not human. They weren't from here at all. At this point, Warren and the remaining other men are said to have approached the beings and had what he has described as a visual standoff. After that, the lower ranking men, himself included, were caught off and told to retreat. Sensationally, the entirety of this close encounter of the third kind is said by Warren to have been filmed by a tripod mounted video cameras. Where this footage is today, or if it even exists, is not known. Undoubtedly, this is an incredible story, making it easy to understand why Larry Warren is considered a highly controversial figure in this case. Despite there being some anonymous claims to support him, other named military witnesses have turned on him, and even Nick Pope, the vocal former head of the British MOD's UFO desk, got into an online spat with him as recently as 2017, with Pope branding Warren's story lies and officially dead. And yet, as dubious as some of Warren's claims may be, if one is so minded, it is not impossible to cast nearly every military figure involved in this case as suspect. From the notoriously problematic, I'm on the MOD's payroll but just want to help Nick Pope, to those at the very heart of the Rendlesham Forest incident, this case is riddled with inconsistencies, misdirections, and straight oddities. For example, for all of his transparency, especially after his retirement in 1991, Colonel Holt provided incorrect dates for the two incidents in his infamous January 1981 memo. Rather than the 26th and the 28th, it is reported to be the 27th and the 29th. An innocent error, perhaps, but problematic given the nature of what we are discussing. Similar is the notebook allegedly kept by Central Security Control Sergeant Jim Penniston said to have been hastily scribbled in as the events of the 26th of December unfolded before his very eyes, when he and John Burroughs approached the Black Triangle and experienced time distortion, it too is misdated to the 27th. There is also said to have been an issue with the original incident being recorded in the base's logbook, doing little to alleviate concerns of date inconsistencies and conflicting reports. When Penniston was asked why his supposedly of-the-night diary entry appeared to be incorrectly dated, he is said to have simply shrugged the concern away, replying that the figures in his notebook are the actual time and date of the event. When researcher Jenny Randalls asked Colonel Holt a similar question regarding the date issue in his memo, he is said to have been similarly nonchalant. I was asked by the British officer on the base to pen this report to London but they already knew all about the case. It was deliberately muted and left things out. The suggestion thus being that providing a correct date was irrelevant. Then why bother giving a date at all? Indeed, why give specific measurements, such as the one and a half inch deep impression in the ground? Surely, all of this seems a little strange. And, call me unduly suspicious, but it can be also said to be distinctly strange that Paniston's misstated notebook was a latecomer to the Rendlesham narrative, 
seemingly first mentioned in a magazine interview published in 1996. Crucially, as the English science writer and all-round Rendlesham expert Ian Ridpath has stated, Penniston made no mention of any notes or sketches in the extensive interviews he gave for a British TV program called Strange But True in July 1994. And so, why conceal it? Unless, of course, it never existed prior to that date. Might it be that the notebook, and quite possibly its owner and others involved in this case, are therefore agents of disinformation? Additionally, reconsidering the radar data and the earlier mentioned testimony of RAF air traffic controller Malcolm Scurrer, one encounters similar controversy. For indeed, although Scurrer's claims of radar anomalies received much airtime in December 1994, he later contradicted his testimony, stating in the 1995 May-June issue of UFO magazine that the anomaly was actually recorded during a training exercise, dating to either late October or early November 1980, and thus not the Christmas of the Rendlesham Forest incident. Why then was his original testimony pushed so hard? Or was this change of direction a deliberate act of disinformation meant to sabotage the reputation of the wider case? And such a shift towards conspiracy can be said to become all the more tempting when one considers the multiple men in black encounters said to be connected with this case. Writing in another of her books on the MIB phenomenon, Jenny Randalls reveals that, at the time of writing, her only intriguing personal episode to speak of was in relation to the Rendlesham case, when a man called Tom Adams requested an interview about the incident. Supposedly, he was making a BBC radio documentary on UFOs. It was autumn 1989, and in particular, Adams seemed very interested in borrowing Randall's first-generation copy of Colonel Hort's tape recording, which Randall's had received from a military insider a few years prior. The BBC man, so it seemed, believed the tape to be the original, and would not stop until Randall's gave it to him. A copy was not good enough, he is said to have argued, when Randall's offered him just that. Unwilling to let the tape out of her possession, Randalls thus gave the man a different copy, presenting it as the original, stating that she would very much like it returned to her after the BBC was finished with it. Suitably happy, the man left, and was never heard from again. Randalls never received her tape back, and when she contacted the BBC, directed to the department named by Tom Adams, she was told no such person of that name existed and there was no such radio documentary on UFOs scheduled. This was despite the man having provided Jenny Randalls with an exact date for the program. And so, Tom Adams appears to have been a ruse to get what he believed was the original Charles Holt tape. Even more incredible than this are the claims made by Randalls co-author and first out-the-gate investigator Brenda Butler. Speaking at a UFO conference in 2015, to mark 35 years since the Rendlesham Forest incident, Butler described how she and her two co-authors had been hounded by Ministry of Defence officials and police. In particular, she claimed that, on one occasion, the MOD tried to force her to sign a contract that would silence her over her findings. Another time, she was supposedly chased by an army jeep down country roads at 80 miles per hour. That same night, she returned to the forest and allegedly captured strange photographic anomalies, all while a police car and police helicopter observed her from a distance. During the conference, Butler even revealed that people had also come to her home and stood in her driveway, trying to intimidate her. In her own words, we have had phone calls, been followed, and threatened. And Brenda Butler is not the only one to have been warned away from Rendlesham Forest. For, in the immediate aftermath of the incident, a public path was blocked by military and police personnel, with Jerry Davis, one of the locals to see a blinding light above the forest, being rudely told to leave the area when he tried to access it on the 29th of December. On top of this, there is much testimony, including from Forestry Commission woodcutters, that relates to how the landing site was hastily cleared of trees after the Christmas period. Some have said that the trees were radioactive. 
Others have spoken of clear signs of physical impact, as if something had indeed landed or crashed, including what is said to have been a giant crater which was quickly filled in. It is even strongly suggested that the current UFO trail and art installation to mark the landing site within the forest are incorrect, with a full site having been chosen in the days immediately after the original incident, meant to misdirect visitors away from the patch of forest containing the landing indentations and damaged trees. In many ways, what is said to have happened in the aftermath of Rendlesham is comparable to other, more recent, supposed UFO military cover-ups, including the 2016 Penturk incident. Down the far end of conspiracy, there are even claims of a craft removal having taken place, with it said that there were numerous unscheduled flights coming into the base soon after the incident. The suggestion being that they were there to transport a recovered UFO to the United States for study. And so did aliens visit Randlesham Forest in December 1980. There are undoubtedly many who would argue that they did. Certainly, even high-ranking military men, including Colonel Holt, believe something of extraterrestrial origin was encountered that Christmas, even if beings themselves were not explicitly seen. To be able to draw any sort of proper conclusion, I would however argue that there is still information that must be considered, namely the locational significance of Rendlesham Forest. After all, that area can be said to have a long history of scientific and military research. In the 1930s, Suffolk's Orford Ness, the narrow 90-mile peninsula of lighthouse fame onto which Rendlesham Forest backs, was selected as the test site for Britain's radio-based detection project, namely the development of radar. Later, between 1953 and 1971, the same area was occupied by the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. Today, the ruins of the site, now owned by the National Trust, are proudly advertised as containing vibration test laboratories, underground bunkers, and many other Cold War goodies. Then, less than 10 miles up the coast, there are the Sizewell nuclear power stations, the first of which was opened in April 1967. In the opposite direction is RAF Bordsey, also known as the Bordsey Research Station, a military installation famous for having been a Bloodhound missile site, replete with underground control centre, living quarters and air filtration that made it capable of operating during a nuclear attack. The missiles remained until July 1990, meaning it was a site of great national military significance in 1980. Then, finally, within the forested area itself, there were, of course, the two RAF bases, Woodbridge and Bentwaters, operated by the United States Air Force. It is even whispered that the US's National Security Agency was active in the area, working at Orford Ness alongside the CIA on secret research projects known as Cobra Mist and Cold Witness. As recently as March 2022, a spokesperson for the National Trust even conceded, there's still a huge amount that we don't know about the site. Indeed, we'll probably never know the work that the buildings and their infrastructure were involved in. And such is precisely the issue that we face when trying to unravel the undeniable mystery that is the Rendlesham Forest incident. Claims of alien beings and extraterrestrial craft can be made all day, and indeed may hold the answer even in part as to what military men and civilians saw that Christmas. But without knowing precisely what the British MOD, the American Air Force, the CIA and the NSA were working on at the various bases and test sites in that area, we are fumbling in the dark. After all, when one enters the realm of UFOs and ETs, talk of holograms, experimental weapons, secret crafts, ethically dubious experiments, and government psyops are never far behind. And given all of the cover-up and conspiracy which surrounds this case, it is arguably not difficult to believe at least some measure of secret government happenings are to blame for all that occurred. Why else, arguably, would USAF personnel risk a diplomatic faux pas or even outright criminal charges by leaving their base and trespassing on British sovereign soil so as to pursue whatever was going on in Rendlesham Forest those nights? Did they already know what was going on? Did it involve the British? 
Or did something else happen altogether, and the Rendlesham story is one giant act of government misdirection, propagated by military payroll stooges and decoys? I will leave you with one final story, one which comes yet again from Jenny Randalls, the researcher who arguably got the closest to this incredible and complex case. It dates to November 1984, and thus the early days of her research into the Rendlesham incident. She claims to have received a phone call from a Dr. Alan Bond, a specialist in advanced physics and rocketry propulsion, who had done contract work for the MOD. After reading some of Randall's research, the scientist supposedly felt compelled to reach out. After all, according to him, the lights in the sky seen just before the first forest incident were not comets. They were something else, something terrestrial and of huge political sensitivity. In his last phone call to Randall's, he supposedly had this warning to give. I am heading off to a conference in the Netherlands. When I get back, I will not be taking this any further. You do not know what you have got yourself into. You are messing with something for which you can end up at the bottom of the Thames. And so that would suggest not aliens, or at least not just aliens. The Rendlesham Forest incident is a confusing case, one for which we still do not have the full picture, and one which I very much doubt we ever will. Thank you so much for watching, I very much hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and are new to my channel, you might like to explore some of my other videos, including the ones linked on screen now. Equally, I have more content for you to enjoy over on my second channel, Laura Ralton. Until next time, 